Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the planning board hearing of March 28th, 2024. Uh, we have two hearings on the agenda for tonight. What we normally do is start first with public comment on any items that are not on the agenda. So if you have public comment to make on not about Ryan Road or Day Avenue, you are welcome to approach the podium now or enter it via the chat on Zoom. Um, at any point, if you're making public comment at the podium, please state your name and your address. I also want to note that we received uh, public comment in writing from Nancy Smith of Chapel Street related to a uh, discussion about the Landy Ave ANR from the last hearing. The board members have received and read it, and it is entered into the public record. Is there anybody else who would like to make a comment about an item not on the agenda? Please go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Benjamin Spencer. I live on Rust Avenue here in Northampton. Um, I'm here tonight. Uh, I'm a member of a group of citizens who have petitioned a proposed zoning amendment to prohibit automobile sales in the Central Business Gateway District by eliminating automobile sales uh, being allowed by special permit. It's an item that's going to be on your agenda in two weeks' time. Um, it's um, the intention of the group uh, that I'm part of to really help the city um, be thoughtful about how we develop um, the Gateway District, really be mindful of our goals of sustainable Northampton, the goals laid out in the um, zoning for the Central Business Gateway District. And I'm just going to thank you all for your work here. Really appreciate everything you do. And um, I look forward to being here in two weeks' time uh, for that meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else here in council chambers who would like to make a public comment? Yeah. Hi, my name is Mike Kirby. I've got one thing to... I come before you to stand behind you. I come before you to uh, talk about the uh, Old Baptist Church, uh, which is on the agenda in the future. Um, I handed you out a, a written piece. I would kind of went over stuff that I'd written some time ago about the thorny business of appraisals, um, how they're done and how they shouldn't be done. And I have gone through the appraisal that was submitted by Eric Sewer. And it's basically a very, how oh, can I say it? It's a very, uh, it's on a developmental basis. Um, it's basically saying as fully developed, the, the property will be worth such and so. Unfortunately, it cannot be developed at the certain, at the stage it's in right now, because in fact, it can't be heated. Um, and so it sat there for about a year year and a quarter and so essentially i feel like the city needs to go to court there's no other way to resolve this particular situation than to go to court and get a another appraisal and one that will more will establish it essentially the value of it as it is today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else in council chambers who has general public comment?
Is there anybody uh, in Zoom who would like to make a comment via chat? It looks like there are three. Okay, I cannot see them. I think they, so the way it goes is host to co-host or co-host. So it came to, it was sent to me. Okay. So I can read them. Sure. Um, okay, so it looks like we, um, it, one, two, Yes, we have three chat comments. Um, Jacqueline McCreener from Northampton uh, about the revised site plan for 39 Landy Avenue as discussed March 14th. George said the lot subdivision could allow three houses to be built on the property. Actually, three triplexes could be built there by right if the project clears the Conservation Commission, which it might since Wayne Fiden reduced our minimum wetland buffer zones over a decade ago. The developer's February 2022 site concept for parcel shows two triplexes and a duplex across the three lots. We know that seven units or more would trigger a special permit on a single lot, but by subdividing the property first, each sublot could then be built with up to six units as long as other requirements are met. Subdividing first allows the builder to get around zoning limits. This has aptly been called gaming the system. Just remember this lot is in a wetland buffer where more than 10 centuries worth of green uh, tree growth, excuse me, was destroyed. More than 10 centuries of trees and wildlife habitat gone forever. S second chat, Jackie Balance. Jackie Balance from Bay State Village. In answer to David's question on March 14th, how many neighborhoods have been ruined by the board's controversial permitting decisions? Three neighborhoods have been deeply traumatized so far, Bay State, Montview, and now Garfield. My own experience was watching six cookie-cutter so-called luxury homes built almost overnight. None of them has a yard, only minimum setbacks. These are fake colonials on a tiny Civil War era block. With more such lots on Garfield Avenue as well as Garfield Street, Landy Avenue, and property at the corner of Milton and Federal all coming up for development. The problem is ongoing. For many people in this city, our sense of living in a real community and the value of our historical streetscapes are both threatened. My own neighborhood's historic values are on the line. You can learn more about this neighborhood in my booklet, How the Industrial Revolution Shaped Bay State Village, available to read at Historic Northampton. Uh, Mary Lou Wittig from Florence. The board's conversation about Spirit of Northampton was cut short on March 14th. George said, quote, I think it's a valid thing to talk about sometime, put it on the agenda. These infill issues, end quote, these infill issues directly affect people living in actual neighborhoods with their families and with their friends on the block. However, that conversation about infill zoning is not on the agenda tonight. The board was advised that a site plan was just a piece of paper, another a &R to be rubber stamped. However, a site plan is much more than just a piece of paper. That paper has real life impacts on real people who have already chosen to invest their fortunes and their lives to live there. Here, sorry. Runaway infill without genuine community input is an affront to our city's residents, the people who have already chosen call to call HAMP and NoHo their home. And that is it for the chats. Thank you. Okay, we will move to the first 7 p.m. hearing, which is a continuation of a hearing from March 14th for a site plan review for a second unit at 808 Ryan Road. Uh, and just to remind all of us, we issued a special permit uh, on March 14th for a second curb cut. So what we're looking at tonight is the site plan and the pending issues about uh, tree removal and the location of the driveway. Is there a presentation? Great. David Schoen, my wife Denise Schoen, will be presenting our project this evening, continuing from uh, March 14th. Um, the last time we met, uh, we made I uh, met the tree warden on site to discuss the shade trees in the public, uh, his jurisdiction in his area for the curb cut on the Bird's Pit access side. Um, I met with him last Thursday, and um, there's one tree on the, if you look at the property on the right-hand side uh, in the east uh, and uh, on the west side of the property, that will remain. And with that being said, uh, we decided to put the driveway on the opposite side for two reasons, because it was brought up 
we no way wanted to make a through street through there. So if, if the driveway is on the opposite side, and then um, it would prevent that from happening, as well as we're going to put a small garage on instead of in the back, it will be attached to the house, but a small garage on the existing property at the that driveway, again, to prevent anything from ever happening on a cross connection. So we, we can talk, and I'll go through the slides again, if you want to stop and questions, that's fine. So here's the proposed, the, the original house, uh, 490 square feet. Share screen. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. All right. I don't know how to. Yeah, I don't want to mess anything up either. Do you want me to escape here? Hold on. Sorry. It's okay. There you go. Okay. Whoops. Where did it go? Oh. Oh, shoot. Hold on. It okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Slide show. There, there we go. You can reduce this. Hold on. All right, here we go. So the uh, scope of the work really hasn't changed uh, drastically, but we're going to construct a one-story uh, single-family home, approximately 2,400 square feet with an attached garage, living space actually around 1,700 square feet, a driveway for the new dwelling off of Bird's Pit Road, and a second curb cut off of Bird's Pit Road that we discussed at the last meeting. Existing dwelling will remain the same and be a future rental unit and construct a 250 square foot detached single car garage at the uh, original driveway for the original property. And we're gonna be uh, retain some trees identified and we have a couple of slides on that, uh, that we will keep uh, in the front of the property on Bird's Pit. There's a nice cluster of oak trees as well as the uh, the tree and the uh, tree belt for the, for the town, the shade tree. And we wanna to try to minimize the uh, tree, you know, the. The uh, maximize the sunlight for the solar, obviously, as well. So, the original tap, the map from Northampton shows where the property is, existing property with the two adjacent streets. And this is the surveyor's plot plan. All boundaries have been surveyed and uh, marked out with appropriate uh, boundary pins and uh, stakes with ribbons. Uh, that's what the new house will look like. And that driveway would be on the right hand side originally we had it on the left we put it on the right and that, to prevent anything from going through uh, just the the elevate you know the the side and the uh and so that front elevation you showed that will be facing uh Bert's pit yes that's correct that's correct thank you uh the water protection system uh, uh plan WSP uh went up I think it was changed 50 square feet with the original plan to this plan. So the single family house uh, with the square footage, the proposed new house, driveway, um, the lot size. So to remain, we need to have 12,412 square feet to remain and we will have 16,162 square feet. So we do conform to the requirements of WSP. That would be the proposed uh, plot plan with the house and the new driveway and the new uh, detached garage. So we do conform to all the setbacks and the proper you know, boundaries, 20 feet off of each boundary on the right and the left as you look at the drawing east and west. Uh, the front of the Bird's Pit Road, it needs to be at least 20 feet where that's at an angle. We went 20 feet to the shortest, which is on the right-hand side. 
So we do conform with that. I believe the driveway is nine feet, maybe nine and a half. So we conform to that as well. And um, so I think, and same as the um, the detached garage, you know, it's minimal distance, I think was uh, maybe 10 feet from the original house. It's well beyond that, as well as the new structure with the distance between the original building uh, house and the new house. So we believe we conform with all those regulations. And the trees to remain, we have four oak trees located on the east of the property off the Bird's Pit Road. And I do have a couple slides on that. I'll show you. We flagged them with green ribbon. And then the ni they're 19 oak uh, inch oak tree located on the west side of the property close to Bird's Pit, which is a town uh, tree when I met with the tree warden. Um, and I think he forwarded you a copy of that, Carolina, his uh, report on that. We were supposed to send that to you. Your Arbor. No, the... Um, Tree Warden was supposed to contact you about the... Um, yes, he did. Okay, thank you. And then there's, um, you know, a red maple. We're going to keep three young fir trees we would like to keep on the uh, west side of the property. And then a 10-inch maple tree that's already located on the property. Uh, the other trees, as you might have seen in the arborist report, we gave you a revised arborist report with more detail on the species of the trees and some of the sizes of the trees. But there are a lot of uh, trees in very poor shape. There's a, a couple of large uh, white pines. One of them broke already. And, um, you know, we don't want the other trees to fall as well. So they really need to be cleaned up back there. This is the uh, trees on Bird's Pit Road. As you look at the property, the, the picture on the right is the uh, in the tree belt for Northampton and the shade tree that will remain. And on the, on the side, on the right side is the uh, trees that we will keep. And you can see the two stakes where the driveway will be uh, uh, in that side. This here would be the uh, replanting. We plan on uh, adding some trees on the property. There's pro approximately about six trees, six or seven trees we will add in, in the, um, in it on the east side of the property, on the west, about in the middle, and a couple in front of the uh, original house on Ryan Road. And then we can add a couple eventually down on Bird's Pit once we clear that out a little bit more. And then we can, if you want to discuss the, the Arborist Report, I have some slides on that. And I, I think I sent that to Carolina as well. And if there's any questions or... I think I went through it kind of quickly, but we did discuss a lot of this at the last meeting. I know you have a lot going on tonight. Is, um, I think that's the thing I didn't want for. Maybe just another chapter. Tree warden. The tree warden. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, not additional. I thought, no, there was, a, um, there was just a, uh, the warden didn't, the tree warden did not send formal written comments. Oh, okay. It's the same letter. It's the same letter from before then. Okay. Can you go back to the slide that showed uh, uh, about tree replacement? Yeah, right there. Um, sorry, the one that had the calculations on it, 75 to 90 oh, percent. Sure. Yeah, there you go. One more. Okay. Is that the one? Yes. So, so one of the questions from the staff report was about tree replacement. And I think what I'm seeing here is that your arborist report says that all of the trees that would qualify for tree replacement are uh would not actually qualify for tree replacement am i reading that correctly um they're the ones that they're taking down are damaged or um dead or diseased okay and i do have more photos of woodpeckers and the mm -hmm. diseased and i i didn't realize i walked the site with them on what to look for on diseased trees where they're rot from the inside out mm -hmm. with the uh, insects that are in there so they yeah he
Other questions from the board? I just have a comment. So this is a changed layout, but previously you saw a detached garage for this new structure. Now the garage is in front of the unit. The two family standards require parking to be to the side or to the rear. This is a um, relatively unique situation given that you have um, this is a through lot. So the actual second unit is behind the first unit, but it is fronting towards Bird's Pit and it also has the driveway access. Um, so I think that that's a, a point of discussion for the board about how to handle the parking, the attached um, parking structure there. Um, I think, did you say it's 30 feet back, the, the structure from the? At the closest angle, at the angle of the driveway, it will be about 60 feet. Oh, okay. That, that is an angle going out uh, towards Bird's Pit. Okay. So there is a provision. Um, um, so in other sections of the zoning, there are provisions that um, for um, shifting the garage to the um, 10 feet beyond the facade, unless the structure is set back, um, you know, double the front setback. So um, given the distance from Burt's Pit, that may be appropriate. And also given the sort of unique circumstances of this being a through lot and having two frontages where that the primary, it is still an 808 Ryan Road um, property. So just a misstep. Um, it's functional and aesthetic and, and really it's the point of it is more in the urban context where you um, typically have not had attached garages and also that there are sidewalks and there's that um, sort of public private interface where people would be walking on sidewalks close to, you know, closer to the structures and having sort of more impact of only seeing parking or a garage and backing out along a sidewalk. There's no sidewalk in this location. So um, it is different from um, the sort of standard that's been developed for the more urban neighborhoods. And just to reiterate, you're saying that the because of the setbacks, they do meet the standard from these other yes. districts? Yeah. Okay. Does DPW review this? Yes, and they sent their comments at the last meeting, and so... No further comments right. on the new site plan. Right. All right. I think their biggest issue was just about the driveway placement and then utilities, but those would be there anyway. Oh. I was concerned. I was. I don't know if you have the thing, the driveway parallel with the house. I was just thinking of how you make that, if you're coming from the intersection of Earth Bird's trips. Pit and Ryan Road and you're turning left into that driveway, it's quite a turn to try to make. Uh, well, because you're not hitting the street at a 90 degree angle. I don't know that it's a... Can I... Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Please. Um, it's the exact same thing as if you're coming on Ryan Road. The same angle. Um, it's the same yeah. width of driveway. Um, and that's a very different street. Why do you mean it's, you're hitting the the driveway is hitting the street, not at a 90 degree, like not perpendicular. Right. You're hitting it kind of at an angle. It's, that's, I don't know that we, I mean, it's just something That's beautiful. pretty exaggerated if you look at that. If you really on site and look at it, it doesn't yeah. look, you know, as you come out of the driveway. Mm -hmm. And if we come out, obviously the, the traffic will be coming straight on and would see us opposed to coming around Bird's Pit in the opposite side and you'd be blinded you know, by the turn if you came by fast. So we're on the opposite side of the street. So I think that would help as far as any traffic would go or, you know, our line of sight or the driver's line of sight coming towards us on the right-hand side. I think I understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't particularly know if we have anything to say about it other than it's a usability issue, I think, for you. I mean, it's for you to decide, I think. It seems like they answered all the questions that we had. Yeah. Sure. 
Seems like we should. Uh, Damn your mic. Not green. Not green. Um, uh, that seems like a project that you know they they came back and they did the things that we wanted them to do. Um, so, you know, it seems like a good project. So I will uh, open it up to public comment. If there's anybody here uh, in council chambers who would like to make public comment on this project, please come to the podium and state your name and address. Seeing no one, uh, if there is anybody on Zoom, please enter your comments via chat. I don't see any. Do you see any others? Okay. Um, I see that Gwen Nabad is raising her hand. So, Gwen, we accept comments via chat. So, if you'd like to comment on this project, please use the chat function to enter your comment. While we're waiting for that, did we have any other uh, conditions to discuss? I think there's one about uh, traffic mitigation that I saw. Was there anything else? Tree protection, I bet we'll include for those trees that are staying and the public shade tree. Um, yeah, yeah, prior to construction, I would recommend tree protection for the other trees that are staying. And then um, certificate of upon certificate of occupancy, the payment in lieu of traffic mitigation. And how did we come to that figure? Was it three thousand I saw? It's based in the zoning and the um, essentially the district and distance from facilities. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Oh, gotcha. So it's it's higher for the outer reaching right. districts. Right. Okay. So I'm sorry, I was reading chat and taking notes and not listening at the same time. I heard the payment in lieu and yes, tree protection. Yes, prior to construction. And there's no formal requirement for tree replacement because all of the ones coming down are, are diseased. Okay. So we don't have to include that one. And do we have to make a formal statement about the double setback distance to the parking structure in the front? Um, you can note it in the decision, but it doesn't have to be like a condition or anything because he presented the plans. And if you all feel that that's appropriate, you can say as presented and, you know, note the reasons. Uh, we did receive a chat from Gwen Nabad that says, I'm here to support this project so long as there are many beautiful trees remaining. <laughs> I moved to close public comment. Second. Uh, all those in favor of closing public comment? Unanimous. You can sit down. More, more. You can stand. If you like. a... Is there more discussion? Does somebody want to make a motion? <laughs> it's 808 Ryan Road. I can. I'll um, move to approve the project at 808 Ryan Road with the aforementioned um, conditions or two, I believe, uh, or three. Yes, the tree protection. The tree protection. And, and payment and traffic mitigation. Yes. And the project as presented. Uh, yes, payment in lieu. Yes, the traffic payment in lieu of um, traffic mitigation and um, the plan as presented. Yes. A second. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving the site plan at Ryan Road. Okay. Okay. Great. You're all set. Good luck with your project. Thank, Thank you. you.
Okay. Uh, we are going to move to our next hearing, which is a site plan review by Pioneer Development LLC to add three units and four half-scale units at 39 Day Avenue, map ID 25132, um, as well as a site plan review for a second curb cut. Looks like you have a presentation. Yes, I would ask to bring a presentation. Great. So, provide. Right. I'll try to keep it brief, though because I know people don't want to stay all night. Um, like There's like a hundred versions of this. That's interesting. Let's see which one is. Screen sharing has stopped. Okay, I don't know what I just did, but I am trying to get it up. I don't know what I did. I'm sorry. I'm not like the most super technology literate person, but I did open my PowerPoint. Sorry. Um, oh, but it's not running. It's just kind of loading. Hmm. I should have dragged it under the desktop. Yeah, that's probably the yeah, let's just go. And then you have to, whoops. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you for the help. So, hi. Thanks for having me tonight. My name is Danny. I am with Pioneer Development. Um, we are a small developer focused on incremental value-added retrofits of properties within walking distance of downtown. Can I actually, maybe I can play this without the, you know what, give me one second here and I will just try to see if I can get the actual slideshow view up. My apologies from the beginning, but I won't say that again. Um, we're mission driven. Um, we do green, energy efficient, smart growth development. And kind of our idea is this. We do more, more of this so that we can preserve more of that. Um, we are homegrown in Northampton. We began by buying a two family and living on the first in the first floor apartment and adding a third unit into the attic while we lived there. That was interesting. Um, early projects that we did were some single family uh, and duplex rehabs. And one of those was Northampton's first Lead for Homes gut rehab project, which earned gold certification. So I was pretty proud of that. Uh, in our more recent projects, we scaled up a bit and we have been combining renovations of existing buildings with new construction units. So, you probably already know this, but very quickly, we, we think that we are developing um, what the city would like to see, what the sustainable Northampton plan calls for and the zoning calls for, which is um, development that concentrates um, development and allows for a wide range of housing types and walkable neighborhoods to downtown and other commercial centers that takes advantage of existing public infrastructure, leading to the efficient use of resources and promotes environmental performance, energy efficiency, Good stormwater management reduces driving, um, all all of the things. I did want to take a moment um, to just talk about infill. Um, I promise this is my most texty slide. The rest is quick and lots of pictures. Um, but infill adds units or uses in areas that are already developed, rather than sprawling into undeveloped areas. And residents of neighborhoods where you can walk to services and jobs can are able to drive less and do. Um, in terms of equity, more variety and greater supply of in-town housing means more people can afford to live there. And, you know, just kind of as a consideration, new construction can be beautiful and add to the sense of place of a neighborhood, but sometimes neighbors don't like the way a particular project looks or don't want more density on their street, uh, reg regardless of what the zoning says or the sustainable Northampton plan says. And so, you know, we pay, pay really, as a result, we pay really close attention when we do infill to 
creating things that are in scale with the existing neighborhoods that really fit in well uh, to the existing neighborhoods and, and are good design. We make sure that we build attractive homes with yards, porches, patios, all kinds of green spaces and semi-private outdoor spaces for the new residents, gardening areas. We just, we pay attention to all the little details that make a place look amazing and, um, and function um, as a great place to live. So I'm just going to quickly blow through, go through a, a, some projects that we've done so you can kind of get a flavor um, for the quality of development that we do. This is 227 South Street, uh, which was pr previously a commercial property to being uh, converted to residential. And the pictures on the top are the existing, uh, the before condition. The pictures on the bottom are after we developed it. Um, so particularly of note, there was a wraparound driveway on that project and we removed, we eliminated a lot of pavement from that project. So on the right side, you see a, a giant driveway that was all eliminated for the picture right below it, which is yards and grass and a lot more green space than this project had before, this property had before. And, you know, we created really wonderful spaces that I'm super proud of and the residents love and they tell me that all the time. Um, they really use their backyards. Um, we put little patios in. Some of this is very similar to what we're proposing here at Day Avenue. Um, uh, they have little yards with, uh, they're semi-private, so they have, you know, the, the a little bit of privacy that's higher right at the at, at it, but then it kind of opens out to a bigger open space. Um, nice porches. Uh, We'll talk about it later, but this this project has side patios sort of towards the front, um, and people really use these outdoor spaces. Um, it's a really nice expansion of their indoor space, especially since we've been getting smaller and smaller with our units. So that you know that that puts a real premium on nice outdoor space for people to live in for as you know expand their living space for as much of the year as possible. PV, as you can see, is on this project, um, and just like lots of. Lots of nice little features, at which you'll see we're proposing again here at 39 Day Avenue and tweaking and getting better as we go. Um, but, you know, bike racks um, and great landscaping and that kind of thing. Um, here's a project we just recently completed, or at least 99.9% .9 completed, because we're still kind of dealing with a few finishing touches. Um, but um, this was at 36 Hampton Street. There was a five-car garage, the two on the right there in the top left image um, were our garages attached to the neighbors. So those, those came down and you can see what the existing structure looked like that we added a couple units next to it and we improved the existing structure. Um, so the, you know, the top two and the one on the left are the existing and then the one on the right is uh, a picture of what it looks like new. So you could see those two garages on the left match up with the two um, after the, at the third garage from the right in the top left image. And here's some uh, more before and afters here. So the top is before, the bottom is after. I'm really proud of the scale of this project. We worked really hard uh, to make this super cute and um, the residents do tell me that they love it. Um, so here's a little bit more detail from that, but you can see, you know, there's bike racks. Um, we haven't yet filled the planters, so that's how uh, new it is. Um, but there's also kind of covered storage for bicycles behind and just like a, a lot of nice little touches. So the 39 day Avenue proposal that we have here tonight, um, we're providing additional housing types in a walkable neighborhood to downtown. It takes advantage of existing public infrastructure. So efficient use of resources. So we're kind of talking again, how, how does this meet the Northampton sustainability goals? Um, environmental performance, energy efficient new construction, energy efficiency upgrades to the existing structure, solar PV, EV ready. We're exploring the charging stations option um, and you know reduces driving based on uh, where it's located, uh, proximity to town, near transit options, near the bike path. Um, it's, it's a great location for smart growth. Uh, for a nice little infill development. Um, in terms of equity, we're again adding more housing in Northampton and we're adding even smaller units than we did at the last project. We're experimenting with a cottage concept here, which is a 700 square foot unit um, that's like one bedroom and a bonus room um, that I'm pretty excited about. Um, I think it offers a lot of the same function as a full two bedroom uh, by being kind of clever about how the spaces are de designed. 
and how we're using it. And in terms of connectivity, we are connecting a dead end street, which is Glenwood to the neighborhood um, through our private drive, but residents from Glenwood would be welcome to bike and walk through if they would like to walk through to access Day Avenue in the neighborhoods and the bike path and that kind of thing. Um, so existing conditions, we can come back to this if we need to. I just wanted to make sure we had this slide to come back to, but, but you could see uh, Day Avenue is on the left here and the existing structure, which has two units in it, is um, up at the front of the property and then Glenwood um, Avenue dead ends into the back of the property and you can see the developable portion of this um, reasonably large parcel uh, for its location. Um, the proposed plan here um, is for 696 feet, uh, square feet, single family cottages and three 904 square foot units, which are two bedroom, one and a half bath um, units. One is a single family and the other is a duplex. All the units will have side patios, back patios, gardening areas, um, indoor and outdoor storage spaces, um, and roof design that maximizes solar. So we went with a little slightly less traditional look this time. Um, we went with more contemporary in order to be able to maximize the solar um, in this project. And we'll be removing the garage and, and there's some, uh, some slight reconfiguration of the existing home. Uh, so this is looking at the um, the traffic and the parking uh, flow. So, you know, we have a proposed a very efficient use of pavement here. You know, we've really minimized our pavement through the use of a one-way driveway that connects Glenwood Avenue to Day Avenue. Um, you can see the 11 parking spaces there, uh, which very slightly exceed uh, the city parking requirements. And, um, you know, I think also that one-way drive um, design, what also is nice about it is it kind of like splits the additional traffic impacts um, between the two streets, you know, so it's kind of halves them. Instead of them all ending up on Day Avenue, half the vehicle trips essentially are on each street. So I, th I think that's pretty nice outcome of that design as well. Um, so we're looking at the landscaping plan here. Um, so this Plan. Well, actually, this is kind of the final final plan, so it's not showing the, the few trees that are being removed, but um, we're removing, we're proposing to remove seven trees. One's already on its way down, pretty much, and protecting as many as we can, and planting 18 new trees, including two new street trees along Day Avenue, and leaving the existing cherry tree at the front, which is very beautiful, and putting some benches around it for a common outdoor area. Um, and we also have located two open shared open bicycle racks, uh, one over by um, by the uh, the Glenwood side, and the other on the Day Avenue side near the existing house. Um, there's also going to be basement storage in the Day Avenue in the original structure at Day Avenue, where everyone's going to get when we have this at the South Street property. Everyone's going to get a storage area in the basement, and we're also going to put a bicycle rack in the basement where. People can bring their bikes down and lock them inside as well. This is just a flavor for the trees that are being proposed uh, in the planting plan. Um, most likely we're thinking cornice moss, dogwoods um, at the, up at the front, um, sycamores and um, elms and uh, tulip trees. So the larger trees more toward the back where they're not gonna, um, where, where a larger tree is more appropriate and it won't impact any solar anywhere. Um, and then there's going to be a few shrubs on that are kind of offering a little bit of protection to patios for privacy and that kind of thing. Um, so that that's the trees that we are proposing. And this, excuse the kind of bad coloring job here, um, but I thought it would be nice to kind of add a picture that made it really clear where the green, where the grass, you know, and the green spaces are here in relation to the buildings and the pavement. So you can see everything green there is, you know, yards essentially and common spaces. And I also highlighted all of the, um, you know, what doesn't qualify as open space by the city calculation, but is open space to the residents, which is all the patios and the side patios, you know, that all the residents are going to get. Um, so they can come out their side doors off their living room and be in kind of a side front patio that sort of faces the you know street, essentially, or they could go into their backyards uh, for a little more privacy um, and have larger back patios. And with that, oh, actually, no, sorry, I do have one more slide. Um, 
So what you're seeing here is a few pictures of examples of the site furnishings from our other developments, which are essentially the same, um, you know, with small tweaks in some cases, but um, you could see the textured concrete patios. I really like these textured concrete patios. I think they're super nice. Um, you can see the fencing that we use for the, for the privacy. You can see the storage uh, unit sheds that we've been, that every single unit gets outdoor storage in addition to their, um, their indoor storage um, in their houses and the basement storage um, in the main house that they'll have. This is how we build the planters. They're open bottom wood planters. And uh, this is an example of the bike racks that we install, the open bike racks and the trash and recycling system, um, which we kind of work with the pedal people to figure out the best best way to do this. Um, you know, so it's, it's an ongoing process, um, but um, there's some examples. And I'm going to hand it off to John Wallen, um, my engineer, to continue from here. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm the engineer on the project, and I uh, basically handle the water in and out of the building. Um, how can I point on here? Can I point? Yes, I can point. So the um, the sewer we're we're coming out of the back of the units um, toward Glendale, and they'll go into a manhole right at the end of Glendale, and the water will come out of the front of the units or the front of these units and back of these, and that will go out to day. And then uh, the storm water will be an underground system here. It will funnel the site to one drain in the middle. And the stormwater system is designed to mitigate the uh, two-year, 10-year, 25-year, and the 100-year uh, storm. Uh, the state and uh, and the federal requirements only require the 2, 10, and 25, but we're mitigating the 100 as well. Um, and we're also working with, with the DPW on, we may increase the size slightly even beyond that. Um, to accommodate some of the piping challenges we have in the drainage systems in town. And that's it for now. I'll introduce Jeff Penn, the architect. Thanks, Jeff. Good evening. I'm Jeff Penn, the architect. Um, there's, I think that Danny has pretty much covered most of what we would talk about, but here are four plans of the two types of unit that we're providing. On the left-hand side are the small single-family units. They're one bedroom, but we've created a loft area that will accommodate a bed or an office or some uh, extra space, excuse me, for the resident. And then on the right-hand side are the two bedroom units. Um, they all have their own laundry, sackable laundry. They, uh, I've worked with Danny several times and we're very conscious of, I, I'm very conscious of her desire to make nice spaces that have uh, easy furnishing and good quality of light. And in this one, we were able to actually use um, corners to, to increase the light in those living rooms so that these patios are going to be to the sides of the building. So the building is, even though they're going to be um, together, they're going to really feel open and airy. Um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, I haven't, on this one, we have actually reduced the pitch of the roofs because we, this was before we were in consultation with the PV. So now we know what angle we're going to use, which will be about we we're gonna it's gonna be either seven or eight um in 12 we have to determine how to maximize the solar on these mm -hmm. roofs um the left hand side shows a front door it actually will get a cover as you see down below we found a really nice cover that doesn't go all the way to the ground that just suspends off the building so uh, people can knock on the door in not be in the rain um the patios to the side of the units will have a little roof cover the ones to the rear will not um, they will be divided by fences at the rear. So as Danny was showing in those pictures, we'll have nice little gathering spaces outdoors. The entire development as seen from the northwest side, if you were just up Day Avenue, would look like this um, across the property. And with the four central units being the smaller units and the three left-hand units being the two, uh, two bedroom units. And to the right, you can see the existing house on Day Avenue. Um, and then we've done a view from the other side, which would be from the Glenwood side. And again, excuse me, you'll see this will make perfect sense in the real world because the PV, when people catch a glimpse of these units, they'll understand exactly why we have or organized the roofs this way. This way, They'll understand the large windows are going to create really nice, bright spaces on the interior. Um, the articulation of colors, as Danny has done in the past, is just going to be very warm and welcoming. Um, and so... Uh, 
we're ready for any questions I think that you guys have for us. Your mic, Sam. Thank you. I'm sorry. I have to recuse myself because I live in spitting distance from this um, whole project. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> I know. We can don't worry, we can okay. take care of that. <laughs> Questions from the board. Um that 17 inch maple is the existing maple that's there right on the axis of that that's the one you're trying to keep. Yeah. There's a bunch of piping showing right under the look at seems unlikely. Uh, it's aspirational, I guess. The, the electric people just showed up at one of the transformers there, too. So I don't know if you keep it or not. But... Okay. So that would potentially change the tree. Cal yeah. Which one is that? 20 inch. Which... It's only 20 inches. Okay. 17. Oh. Oh, it's under 20. It's just okay. a 17 inch maple that's on the uh, right like street the edge. Uh, this I don't need you to. On that topic, there's two others that are along the backside where the retaining wall is going to go. We're going to try. You're going to try and save those two. Yeah, we, we actually pulled the retaining wall two foot off of the line for that purpose. Right. We try to stay away from as much as we can. Right. And where do those fall with caliper size? Because you may or may not be successful in that. Um, I, think the plan. I mean, we can figure that out later, but, yeah, yeah. you know, it's... Yeah, they, they have time. We could see that you pulled it in to try and save yeah. those trees and retaining walls have un, um, usually large <laughs> footprints when you start digging for them, so... This is only this high. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. It's probably still going to have a two foot plus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are the, can you just clarify, are those trees on the subject parcel or are they on the abutting parcel? Split. Okay. Well, yeah, one of them is pretty much on the line and the other one, I believe, is ours. Might make sense to require an arborist report about how to protect those during construction for that wall. So noted. Carolyn, you had some comments? If, I don't know if there are other questions on board. Just go on staff. I have comments from the fire department. Okay. We're going to have Okay. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit more about uh, trash pickup and uh, snow storage and removal on the site. So I know you've shown the little those little covered units for the trash and recycling bins at the back. Where are people bringing those when trash pickup happens? Where um, and yes, what's the plan for snow removal? Okay. Um, you go back and get the colored one, maybe. Yeah. Oh, did I go too far? No. Nope. There's a nice uh, colored snow removal. Snow storage. Sorry, could you just approach the bench just so people on Zoom can hear you on the mic? Thank you. There's a uh, colored snow storage uh, drawing inside the stormwater report that sh that shows where all all of the uh, snow storage goes. I don't think Danny has one in here. We saw we had. We had a drawing in one of the packages that showed snow storage in about 10 different locations. Is that what you're referring yeah, to? The idea is I can try to show you on this if I can get my mouse to go. Can you see that mouse on there? Mm -hmm. yep. So here, well, here's where the trash is being kept right here, these three bins. And we're going to surround those with bollards. And then the uh, this fence right here is removable to be able to push snow into this backyard. And then this is clear enough to get a truck or a small loader up through here and store all along in here. In fact, actually, th these are arrows on here that are indicating the snow storage in, in this area. And then any place we can tuck it, we are up, up here in this area, this area, this area. And on big storms, it's going to have to be removed. It'll have to be taken off site. Is this like a plow truck that's going to do this? No. no. We've got 
if you see this site at Hamden, it's very similar to this. Okay. There's it's got little spots to put stuff all over the place. So it's happening by hand by the they're using small snow blowers. Do you know how they're moving it? I think he starts with a truck and then comes in and yeah, the truck probably it's not a road though. It's what? I think the scale is different from Hamden to this property. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to picture how a plow truck even starts at Glenwood and makes this turn with all these parallel parked cars here and gets to Day Ave. And as it's pushing snow, where it goes, I just don't see. I mean, how far off are these smaller units, the face of these smaller units from the driveway? Like three feet? What's that? How far off are the face of the half size units from the driveway? Three feet. Three feet. And then you have parallel parked cars on the other side. On the other side. So how does a plow truck? Well, a plow truck, six foot plow, and it's a 12 foot wide driveway. <laughs> six foot plow. Okay. You know, a pickup truck, plow truck, not a town plow truck. And with the removable fence, I mean, isn't there a parking spot right in front of that? So I guess that person couldn't park there. Yeah, they'd have to move their car to get on plow day. I think everybody's going to end up moving their car on plow day. Uh -huh. So if we have a winter... It's done in a couple of rounds. Usually, you know, so at South Street, there's 13 spaces, and it's pretty tight as well. And they come through, and they remove, you know, some of it, because there's a lot of cars that aren't there all the time. You know, people come in and out, and then they come back again. You know, some residents then get out, go to work, do their thing, and then the plow people come back and do another round. You know, is that a parallel parking situation on that parallel property? Space. And there's also perpendicular spaces. There's both. Carolyn, do we have any? What are the um, dimensional requirements for parallel spaces? Are they still eight and a half by eighteen? Um, yeah, all the parking spaces required are the same, except for when you do angled parking. Those dimensions are a little bit different. Um, you do need 18 feet of backup space. Um, and that one space it doesn't have, I mean, you have to be able to, I mean, for parallel, if you can pull forward and then out, that's okay. But I'm not sure, it's not clear exactly how that one space where the removal of fence yeah is located would um work with the given the bollards on the other side but yeah usually getting in a parallel parking spot you've got to back into it and so you would just pull out of it if you've got cars parked here you don't have backup space behind those cars so it's no different than yeah i mean i don't know why northampton doesn't do this but in a lot of towns you'll see um the minimum length for a parallel parking space is 20 feet ah. just so it's more maneuverable so having just an 18 foot space is it's not a giant pickup truck spot that's for sure let's i'd love to hear what the just... fire department thought actually because that's going to be more critical than the parallel parking uh, <clears throat> yeah so um there was some discussion this afternoon with the applicant and the fire department um and um, sorry, let me just pull this up. It sounds like the details haven't quite been ironed out, um, but the um, the they are asking for <clears throat> thirty feet curb to curb turning radius, and asking for the ladder truck um, to be able to maneuver in there. So I don't. Um, so I think that maybe Danny needs to describe the conversation you had with the fire department about where that would be or how they would pull in and have 150 feet of length to the back of the structure. Yep. I, so I talked with Captain Stolmeyer just after five today and we kind of went and figured out, you know, what, what the concerns were, um, she was fine with the width of the driveway, and you do not need to be able to turn a full fire truck in. You can bring it in and then back back out to the street. Um, she, she said that basically 
wherever you put the fire truck, it needs to be within 150 feet of the various parts of the buildings. Um, so if you were to pull a fire truck all the way in from Day Avenue to the end there and just stop it, you're within 90 feet of the end corners. Another option is it could come in from Gl Glenwood Avenue and just go straight and park. And then it's, you know, the same distance, 90 feet to the back. Um, so that was pretty, she, her main concern was that she, we want, she wanted to discuss further, but she said it sounded like we could figure it out. It's just that the turn in from, um, from Day Avenue into the driveway, um, making sure that it had an adequate radius. Um, so we're gonna, you know, I think that we're gonna actually just have them come out with a fire truck probably and, uh, you know, test it as it is presently. Um, that's one option. The other option is they could also just come in from Glenwood, but I don't know what their notes would need to look like. If you need to actually have like a Glenwood address or if they can have it in their notes to come in from Glenwood, then you don't have to make a turn at all. You just come in straight and then back, back out. Um, so it's like there, there were options. Basically, she said it sounded like it was fine and we could figure it out. But as far as getting in from Day Avenue, she did mention that we should take some time to look at that turning radius for the fire truck. So I would just say that you um, can't have a 30 foot wide um, curb opening, but um, 24 would be the maximum allowed with a site plan given the location, but you could, um, um, mountable curbs might be appropriate instead of having an opening for the curb radius. Um, so, and then there may just need to be different material use in that, on those corners by the I, drive. I think they may have been talking about the inner radius of the driveway. So, no? no? It was... we, talk, we went through that. Sorry, can you be at the podium again? Thank you. Sorry, we did go through that with them. The fire truck does not need to turn that in a radius. They just need to be able to pull in. Is that the 30 feet that was in the note, though? No, the 30 feet had to do from turning into the driveway from day at. Oh, okay. Yeah. Radius they were talking about, though, right? Not a curb to curb. Like, I don't think they want a 30-foot wide road. No, that's not what I'm saying. But even when you have the dimension across to the radius, that's too wide for a residential street. So you have to do something like a mountable curb if it's still going to work. Um, can you describe when you're coming off of Glenwood Ave, how does this driveway interface with that street? Is there, because there's parking on the right-hand side of Glenwood in front of that neighbor so there's kind of on-street parking so as you drive up on the page here this this see my mouse yep that's the edge of the pavement right now so that's where that person parks that's where the off the side street parking is right now yes <laughs> just one i think <laughs> i was there today it's hard to tell there's a small i mean you could park a car there i don't know that's a legal parking space between the curb cut for that house and where the end of the street is, but I mean, the end of the street's not staked either right now, or maybe it is, I didn't see it. I didn't see any marking on that street for parking. Well, there's no markings. No, definitely no markings. <laughs> well, all so on the left-hand side of Glenwood, as we're looking at it, it says no parking. And on the right-hand side of Glenwood, it doesn't say no parking. So people okay. park there. Right, there's just a driveway that's not shown on this plan for that existing dwelling that's... The one on yeah, there's the a last way pretty close to the end of the street. Looks like they've paved like their entire lot as a driveway to the end of the street. It's pretty I, that might be on the other side. I think these guys are talking about the house to the right as you're right, going yeah. in from Glenwood. Yeah, that... And I think those it sounded like those folks are here tonight. And there was a car parked right in front of where that entrance. Right where it says Ave. Yeah, right where it says Ave. There was parked their car parked there the other night. Now, whether I mean, that's legal parking or not, I don't know. But I think that was also referenced in your notes. But it makes for a pretty tightly maneuverable corner with that tree that you're hoping to save, and maybe a car parked there and a pretty narrow driveway to be able to get anything in there, let alone a fire truck backing up. Yeah. Great. There was a very cool Camaro in the driveway. I just like to put that into the record. Mm, yeah, noted. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, well, we can talk more about the 17 inch maybe. Yeah. Can we come back to the the um trash storage? So you said that there are going to be bins and bollards in front of that um parking spot. So are those gonna be bins like a single yeah, uh, she showed, size bin? She showed pictures of the bins. Might be able to find them. It's a like a wooden looking structure yeah, yeah. that fits two bins in it. Right, but how is the trash getting removed from those to actually get off site is what I'm wondering right. about. Yeah, why don't we just show the picture again? All right, let's show you. Anyway. Oh, oh, I gotta get to that. people does a fair amount of uh, bespoke. Yeah, so if that bottom right, uh, it would be something like that. And then inside those would be, uh, I think 30 gallon bins for either trash or recycling and then the pet so you just load your trash in and sort it you know open it or you can open the front and then the pedal people come by and unload it all mm -hmm. and then they go that's kind of how the other properties go carolyn is it a problem that if pedal people went away this <laughs> would not be a viable arrangement um well, I mean, people can always take their um, garbage on their own to the transfer station. They would not be allowed to put a dumpster on the property without coming back for a site plan amendment. So, I mean, it's up to the applicant to figure out how to to take care of the, to remove the trash. Okay. So it's approvable as is, but they would not, if, if pedal people were no longer an option, they would need to figure something else out, possibly revisions to the site plan. Right. Okay. Danny, get a pickup. <laughs> and as, so as proposed, that's uh, just a paved area with bollards around it. And then these wooden bins are sitting on that pavement. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, the 40% open space, you guys are on the razor edge, edge, edge of it. It's just fine. Um, we want to make sure that you've calculated in everything, including the top of your retaining wall, you know, the sheds that are going to go out there. Um, and if we do approve it, we will most likely require you to get an as-built survey done before your um, um, CFO. The, uh, the top of the retaining wall has actually got earth on it. It's actually what got earth on it. Oh. Either way, you're to the place. You're right there, so it is right there. I know. You know, and round and round with yeah patios. I'm like, you're over. No, nope, right, you're not over. <laughs> right. So, um, you've obviously been doing this for a while, but you know, if you if you don't if you don't get under, you won't get a C of O. So just keep that in mind. If I if I may say. The open space regulation, it does seem a little bit interesting that, you know, patios kind of count against you. So we had to reduce our patio sizes. Yeah. That feels to me like usable open space to a resident. So I, I do feel like maybe you could take a look at those definitions and how you're calculating that, what open space really is, you know, because I'm having to go, you know, yeah. and, you know, you're saying the sheds. They're just plastic sheds from Home Depot. That's going to detract. Well, then our patio, if that's really going to be counted in open space, which it's just furnishings from a big box store, then our patios are going to get smaller. So the usable space of a resident is going to go down because of your calculation. And I know that's probably not what you're intending. No, no, it's 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 a it's a valuable perspective. It's just you know we're looking at uh, pervious space. You know, space for we're greenery, groundwater recharge. Yeah, yeah, but that's all yeah. taken care of in stormwater. That's being done again as stormwater. And in stormwater, we take out the sidewalks too. And that doesn't count in open space. It's, it does not making logical sense is all. Well, the, the open space requirements exist as they are. And I, yeah. so the requirements, I think, will stand for this project. So um, as stated, we would need to see an as built that you had not exceeded that calculation. And if the um, conversation with the fire department proceeds in such a way that you need to change the dimensions of the driveways at all, then certainly you would need to factor that into your calculations.
actually they would change out on the curb, which is on city property. And that's not in our calculations. Okay. Other questions or comments from the board at this yeah. stage? At this moment. Anything else from DPW? I mean, there were a fair number of comments. Yeah, Carolyn, do you want to maybe go through anything else from the fire department and DPW? Thank you, David. Um, so, um, they're asking for detailed, you know, information or, um, construction on the water lines, but for storm water in particular, they're asking for conditions um, related to um, um, getting both connection permits and also providing the storage capacity in the subsurface detention system to make sure that it holds um, uh, the volume for the flows for that site for the two and 24 our design storm um, and to revise the plans to provide additional grading details and drainage structures to specify how the stormwater flows, including the roof runoff, will reach the um, drain point one and subsurface detention system. Um, they're asking for revisions for the drainage calculations to DPW for review prior to um, issuance of a building permit. And then the, the responsibility for inspection and maintenance and a management system should be um, recorded um, with um, the plans. And they need to actually, because they're connecting to the city system, um, they're saying that since the stormwater system is directly connected to the city system, stormwater management operations agreement will have to be signed with um, Department of Public Works. So that's a little bit different than typical because usually it's handled, sometimes it's handled on site and not with a direct connection. So do we usually approve plans that don't have a stormwater permit yet? Yes. So he, the, the difference here is just to clarify, this is less than an acre of disturbance. So anything less than an acre of disturbance, but is a major project requires a stormwater analysis and DPW as the city's engineer evaluates it and can approve connections to the city system or approve review and make sure that the, it's not going to um, be an have an impact to the city system. If it's over an acre, then it's a separate permitting process through Department of Public Works. So this is um, this one in particular doesn't require a stormwater a separate stormwater permit, but um, they will require a maintenance plan to be signed by Department of Public Works because there's a direct pipe connection to the city storm drain system. Okay, and they noted a lot of their concerns with you know there hadn't been or there weren't records of test pits and, and things done at the infiltration. Right. So now they're, they're not doing infiltration they're doing retention. So it's going, it's, Oh, there's no, there's no infiltration. That's right. It's being retained on site. And then the, oh. that's what the direct connection is. Um, that's what the direct connection is, is, um, to, because the, the water's just being retained underground and then it'll be, um, slowly um, sent to the city system. Interesting. And was that because uh, of soil types? You have restrictive soils? Yeah, area? there's water down about five feet. So you get water mounding and there's a potential for contaminating a groundwater table. So, right, so infiltration, you have to be two feet above seasonal high groundwater. Yep. And so they couldn't do that. And in fact, um, existing conditions, the water that lands on the site infiltrates to the extent it can and then, you know, percolates and drains off. In this scenario, it's basically taking all the water and discharging it off site. So it'll be a different condition in the constructed scenario versus existing condition. Those were the primary 
Yes, and then they just have um, so um, just notes for the applicant about fence permits required and addressing and general utility. Um, so um, questions. Um, thanks. Uh, so yeah, I mean, related to those test fits, they still need to make sure that the um, even the retention system is um, above seasonal high groundwater. So, um, and then DPW recommends drafting and implementing a simple erosion and sediment control plan during construction to minimize impacts on the adjacent properties. That's submitted. Um, and um, let's see, then all their other comments are sort of water related. Okay. Yeah. And then I just had a couple of questions about um, screening on the property line. Um, can we see the site plan again? <laughs> yeah, I don't wanna touch I it. selected something. It's okay. Yeah, I got it. Let's see, slide two. So uh, just along that line of parallel parking. Yes, I get it. Um, so yes, we're proposing screening along the line of parallel parking, as you saw. We are, let's see, where is it? Yeah. That's, that's fine, that's pretty good. Um, so yeah, so we're proposing screening along this line here. What is it? Of a six foot privacy fence or allowing for, as we did with Hampton, the option of if the, that direct neighbor approves of some alternative, they could be substituted in after the fact, but six feet or some other acceptable alternative if some other agreement came, um, they came to with us. And then on this line, we're proposing a screening fence here, um, this neighbor has asked me um, if they could have some of our yard to expand their backyard. So I'm trying to figure out a way to make that work. Um, but I think what we what that ultimately we do, assuming we could come to an agreement on how to give them an open space easement out here, would mean that our screening fence would go like that, um, and then they would essentially get this parcel um as an easement an easement a use easement and then there's a few structures around that we thought we might want to screen for our own residents until they get spruced up in the future there's so we proposed a little you know a little screening back here and um along this the backyards line of those units and then there's some existing there's some existing fencing along that side already and then is how tall does that retaining wall end up being? Does it get over 30 inches? Yes. Is there fall protection required at the top of the retaining? It starts at four feet on a site. Okay. And we won't exceed that. Okay. What's the total height of the fence on top of the retaining wall relative to the adjacent ground? I think that was in negotiation with the neighbor. No. Uh, we're not proposing a fence. It's this one right here. Oh, I see. And and seeing that that's on top of a retaining wall, we're talking the retaining wall there is about this high. It's right, just... but the maximum height for a fence is six and a half feet. Okay. Yeah. I think we have it called out as six right now, but um, I don't see it on the drawing here. Six and a half feet from which side of the retaining wall? Average oh, finished grade. You're saying uh, <laughs> you're saying six and a half feet from where? From the average finished grade. So you have to look at both sides. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it'll have to come down. So six and a half feet from the low side of a retaining wall is basically the rule. The average of front. From the average of the low and the high. Average of the low and the high. And is that average taken along the length of the fence or just at some particular spot? 
an average. You can figure it out. <laughs> what, what is that? Slides? Yeah, the average of both. The sides. average of both sides. <laughs> Level on the end. So, if say this is two feet, the net is one foot. Yeah. Okay. Yes. A, a fencing sub that knows the math. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what about where the, the fence gets close to Day Avenue? Is there a rule about how high it can be when you get close to a street? Yes, so it can't be taller than three feet within five feet of the front lot line. Okay. It's like that yeah. further. I think there was a comment I saw somewhere about just dimensioning of the overall parking and the drive and stuff. And I think if you start to look, there are some dimensions in there, uh, but they're not, you know, sort of like this and it's typical. So you can kind of make it out, but. Um, I don't know. Is DPW okay with the dimensioning? Sounds like they. I just I have general concerns with the parallel parking spaces. Um, although I guess they meet the regulations, so I I would just be concerned number one that they're only eighteen feet long. And number two, they're so close to this six foot fence. I don't, I mean, I consider myself a pretty good parallel parker. I feel like the corner of your bumper goes out over the curb line when you're, when you're backing in. So I, I feel like you would hit the fence as you try to back into this spot. Someone may, but there's parking parallel along many buildings in town and people don't run into the building, but some may. Okay. I don't have to fix it. <laughs> what is the drive aisle dimension? That, that I couldn't find dimensioned out. Excuse me, which one are you looking for? Drive. Oh, the drive aisle next to the parallel parking. 12 feet oh, wide. Eight. It's down by the uh, entranceway, the dimension line. If you look at the entrance on day, that's where I'm looking here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Guess we got to get you on the right. Let's hear David. You can see. Oh, I'm looking on the what's on the server. Right. So it's ten when you're coming from Glenwood, and then opens up to twelve yeah, it along. It's the a twelve box. right away there. Yeah, we made it ten to try to again try to save that tree. Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about that. It's quite tight there. You're trying to save a tree that's probably doesn't, that tree has a lot of people gunning for it. And uh, and it seems like it's a very tight part of the site. Uh, what, what's the minimum drive aisle? We have a 12 foot drive aisle here. What, what could it be? What's the minimum along the, the long drive width wise? Um, I, it depends. There's not a minimum in the zoning. So for a driveway, you, I mean, it's a one way too. So 12 feet is pretty ample for a one way. Um, you know, driveways range anywhere from eight to 10 feet wide. Right. Yeah. Cause you could tighten the drive aisle a little bit and then have some space between the curb and the fence. Like bring the curb over a little bit, and then you would have to jump the curb before you destroyed the fence. I think the problem, the issue, would be with the fire trucks. They would probably want a minimum of twelve um, for at least a portion of of the driveway where they would pull in. Yeah. Mm. Six inches. They could also shift those those half size units a little closer, like down. To get a little more room. Right. South, you mean? Yeah. Or whatever. I don't see a north arrow. I don't yeah, down. Just third, <laughs> third bridge street. There's a lot to think about here. Do we wanna Yeah. Um, Should we open it? Yeah. Up? Um yes. So why don't we go ahead and open it for public comment? Um, as I said at the beginning, when you uh, please raise your hand and I will call on you. And when you approach the podium, give your name and your address. And 
There are many of you here tonight and lots of people on Zoom. We want to hear from all of you, but ask that you keep your comments fairly brief so that we have time to hear all of you. And what we'll probably do is um, we don't we won't necessarily respond to your comments right when you make them. We often will kind of listen to the gestalt and then ask discuss amongst ourselves and ask follow up questions to the developer at the end. So if we don't address your questions right away, trust we heard you and we will address them in due course. And there is um, I've been in conversation with one of the residents, they wanted to do a presentation and know that sort of they grouping their comments together within that presentation. So um, um, I don't know how many people there are speaking to that, but that's sort of the um, they've asked for to to do that. So they have a PowerPoint. OK, great. And what we'll do is call on people here in council chambers first and then move to people on Zoom. Um, so. Is there somebody here in council chambers who would like to speak about this project? Please. Hi, my name is Aaron Irvin. Um, I'm in the butter. Danny, I'm pleased to actually put a face to the name. I've heard a lot about you. Um, Can you give your address, please, Aaron? Yes, I live at 20 Glenwood Avenue. Thank you. I'm in a butter to this proposed development. I'm just going to read my thing. I, it's been very interesting to listen to you all. Um, and great that you, I, I feel that you have caught a lot of the things that we have already, that we in the neighborhood talked about, but I'm just going to read my thing because I wrote it and here it is. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you here and to represent some of my neighbors. We recognize that the population is growing and infill is needed to accommodate that growth. We live in a city that is committed to a carbon neutral, sustainable future. And we know that that will be achieved through collaboration of municipal policies and private choices by developers. We have had other construction in our neighborhood, three low profile buildings in a parallel lot at the top of Day Avenue a few years ago raised no red flags for me. The density seemed appropriate to the lot and in keeping with the neighborhood. There's lots of great things in this proposal. It was really interesting to hear you talk about what you do. Um, and I'm I'm glad to see the original house preserved and renovated. I'm glad the new construction provides small, efficient homes. The use of solar energy and rainwater collection are mandated by city ordinance, and I appreciate the developer's offer of a walking and bike through way for neighbors. Um, we understand that one goal of infill housing is to allow working people with low and middle incomes to live and invest in our community. The proposed units, if they're rented at market value, will cost over $2,000 a month, which is almost affordable as a mortgage, but pretty expensive rent, and will just lead to more people living in smaller houses together. The density of this development does not provide a lot of usable green space on site, to my observation. Um, I understand that the measurable, hence regulatory definition of green space is about water percolation. But evidence shows that there's lots of other significant values for green space. The plan creates a drive through for cars from Glenwood to Day Avenue. Based on the number of cars that turn around in my driveway and have for the 25 years that I've lived there, I am confident that it will not take very long for this private driveway to become a de facto city street. Current practice is for plows to pile snow at the end of Glenwood Avenue. That will be problematic under the proposed plan, and there is no alternative offered for snow removal from Glenwood. Climate change is a fact. We can be sure there will continue to be more and heavier rains. The city is already dealing with storm drains being overwhelmed. The recent construction on Sherman Avenue has had an immediate visible impact on runoff there. Water collection is an increasingly important issue that needs to be planned for and addressed through broad-based, long-sided solutions rather than piecemeal. We have accepted other infill developments in the neighborhood and welcome a smaller development at 39 Day Avenue. We're asking the planning board to reject creation of a drive-through from Glenwood to Day Avenue and to reduce the number of units built. My neighbors will speak to you further about other specific issues raised by this proposal. Thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you. Are there others? Please. I do have a thumb drive. Probably will need some assistance getting it to play correctly. Sure. So. Pardon me? 
Did you put it in? I put it in, yeah. yes. Is Andrew Deval Patrick? That's fun. Is Andrew Deval Patrick? No, it's not. It's under 39 days. Because yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't know he was coming. <laughs> it would have been kind of exciting. Right? It would have been very nice to see him again. And then you just need to share. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Nancy Mahevic, and I live at 51 Day Avenue. I share that 256 foot um, property line with the proposed uh, development at 39 Day. And we understand that the hearing is a technical permit and that the board must determine whether or not the standards um, for site approval have been met. So most of our comments are going to try to address whether or not the project meets various aspects of code. I'll be looking at mass, scale, open space, and required distance between uh, units. <clears throat> so the developer plans to put six 34-foot tall buildings in an area approximately 30 feet by 160 feet. For perspective, that's about half the distance, half the width of City Hall, and from the top of City Hall to less than the building that we're in now. So it's a very small space that they're putting in. Now, what we're talking about is this space here. Um, uh, 350 attachment 7 3 3 says for new building setback scale massing should fit, fit within the block face. Now, there are other buildings um, on the street that are about as tall as these, uh, slightly shorter. But we think that the combination of the height, the number of buildings, and how closely they're grouped together means that we're not really matching the scale and mass of the current neighborhood. So although it might meet the standards in uh, letter, we don't think it meets the standards um, in intent. Um, they violate a 350 attachment 7-1, which requires 40% of open space. Uh, there's some discussion about this. Uh, the um, I've been told by Carolyn that the retaining walls, in fact, are considered to be impermeable. If you add those, the sheds, the rain barrels, actually, because they do take up space that would be green otherwise, you end up at about 37% open space. So they're clearly violating the open space part. If you take a closer look at units three and four and units five and six, we argue that the definition of these as duplexes is a serious stretch. Uh, take, unit, take units three and four. They're about five and a half feet apart. There is a, um, a patio that separates them, and there is a roof that attaches them. Uh, we contend that it's not really shared space at all. The, um, the uh, patio that's between them cannot directly be accessed by unit three. It can only be accessed by unit four, so it's not shared. The only thing that's shared is the canopy, the roof. Why did they do that? Well, I can't move from here. If they make them 10 feet apart as code requires, then you push unit six nine feet into the driveway. If you move the driveway, if you have it jut to the right instead of the left, then you move unit nine, 11 and a half, nine feet over the uh, the setback requirement. So you're about 11 feet from the, from the end of the property. So the reason that they're doing it is so they can put more buildings in a smaller space. And we contend that the definition of duplex for these units is really not, it's very spurious. They're not truly duplexes. They're only pushed together with that roof over them so that they can fit more buildings in. Okay. Oh, I didn't. Okay. Well, how do I move this to the next slide? <laughs> um, you have a mouse there. You can use that. If you yep. Like. I jump in? Yeah. I'm going to move this. Yeah. Sorry to take up time. And then press this. 
Okay, there we go. So these are the uh, the different aspects of code that we think are being violated or met only in letter and not in, in intent. Hi, my name is Gretchen Scholl. I live at 28 Sherman Ave. I am behind this property to the left. Uh, our main concerns are about well, our land is feels like it's at capacity for water absorption and that this will only exacerbate it further. Um, we realize that there are many laws and rules that they're talking about that will help with water mitigation. But as you can see, five new units just went up at uh, across the street from me on Sherman Ave. And this is the new water we have now in the street directly. The one on the left is during a rainstorm. The one on the right was this morning when there wasn't as much rain. Um, so there are two sections that we are looking at. Uh, we're asking, so there's code 350.11.6a, the requested use protects adjoining premises against seriously detrimental uses. If applicable, this shall include provision for surface water drainage. Chapter 290.28b2 specifies that post-developmental peak discharge rates for stormwater management systems shall not exceed pre-development peak discharge rates. The evidence presented by the developers doesn't allow us to conclude that the systems will meet these requirements. There is a slight misrepresentation of the amount of permeable area in the hydrocad calculations. They don't include the area used by sheds, rain barrels, and retaining wall. Uh, we also don't know about the back retaining wall, all the information yet. Maybe some of that will be more clear tonight. They'll add about 1,500 cubic yards to fill in the land but it doesn't specify the type of soil. I know that came up before, but the type of soil is very important. Uh, the experience I've had with 29 Sherman Ave across from me has shown me that yes, a developer could say, because there was a stormwater report for 29 Sherman Ave that says, overall, the proposed stormwater management system will provide a significant improvement over existing conditions by providing stormwater storage, peak rate discharge reduction, not currently available on site. But as you can see, that is not correct. That is not what happened. The stormwater drainage systems on um, Sherman and Day are different. Down the middle of the properties on Day Ave, behind me, down the middle of my driveway, there's a city drain that keeps going underneath all the way out to the Connecticut. There's heavy water in that area. It's very wet. Uh, it's proposed that rain barrels will provide some relief, but we know with the heavy rains, it only comes to a very small capacity. Um, so if there is additional runoff from 39 day, it'll enter the drainage pipe on Day Ave and Sherman increasing the amount of water that will result in multiple harms to the community members, the people who live on that property, and the city. We have safety concerns, especially here, as we've seen um, for vehicles, pedestrians, hydroplaning. Uh, the one on the left turned completely to ice the following morning. There's no way to get around it. The entire street was filled. Um, and also the city has had to come already. These homes were just completed. Actually, they're still completing the inside and they've already had to come in and fill in potholes in the street. So the damage from the standing water and over time will cost the city money. It costs a lot of uh, just headaches for the whole community in terms of the driving. So I know that the that was the last piece coming in just recently to fix that. 
But our biggest concern is water absorption, more water runoff, uh, a lot that is comparable to the surrounding lots with single homes filling in with nine units. I understand one is existing, moving to a two family, adding seven more feels like a little too much for the neighborhood. Thank you. My name is Jackie Barron. I'm at 35 Day Avenue, so I'm in a butter on the other side. Um, and I fully support developing more housing in our neighborhood and in Northampton, but I am also representing some concerns that the neighborhood has about the plan as proposed. Um, one concern is setbacks of accessory structures, um, code 350, attachment 7-1 that accessory structures must be four feet set back from the property line. And there are currently two new sheds as part of the plan that are less than four feet from our property line. Um, and we would like them just moved away from the line to follow code. Um, additionally, uh, code 350 11 f2a that in all residential zoning districts, sidewalks should be at least five feet in width. We would certainly want any new potential residences to be accessible, um, if at all possible, to people with disabilities. And while there's no dimensions in the plan proposed, the, based on the scale, they do not appear to be five feet in width. So that's a concern we have. Um, there's also the location of the transformer at the Glenwood entrance to the driveway. Um, we're aware that this is a Department of Public Works issue, but if the transformer needs to be relocated, then it could have an impact on open space, which, as people have already discussed, may be inadequate. Um, then there's the fact that a car can park less than three feet from the transformer would be a concern. And we question how far the transformer should be from water and sewer lines. Um, we believe that the requirement is 10 feet, but wanted to raise that as a concern. Uh, and my final point um, just addresses the fencing that's already been discussed. Um, all abutters have requested or will request fencing. All fencing should be installed so that the finished side faces the abutter. Um, each abutter will specify the dimensions they would like depending on the location. Thank you. Please. Hello everyone, my name is Kerrigan Barron. I use they, them pronouns. I am from 35 Day Avenue. You just heard from my wife. Um, just so you know, uh, we are butters to this project and to this property. Specifically, I'm coming here to talk today because we're also, you know, foster parents to teens. And in a lot of that, we have to talk about parking because teens need parking. And we have quite a few issues that have already somewhat been flagged, but specifically want to dig into some details here. So specifically, one of the biggest pieces is that uh, 350.11.6 says to promote in, uh, safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement within sight. One of the biggest things here is that it's a one-way drive, right? It goes all the way through. Anytime you're parallel parking and then stopping, there's no sidewalk to get there. You're walking down the one-way street in the driveway at night, especially for any of those like seven, eight, nine properties at the very back. You're walking all the way down that driveway. And it's a long piece that they're going to have to walk down with vehicle, vehicular traffic available, especially since we've already raised the fact that there's the cut through that would be going from Glenwood to Day Ave. The next piece that we really wanted to talk about is 358A, basically uh, a 18 foot backing up and maneuvering area is needed for each of these different capable capabilities. It can be backwards or frontwards, it just needs to be adjacent. We've already flagged, and I think you saw yourself, that there's not that space for the one that's placed along Glenwood. 
and then one of those spaces along those 10. You just don't have that maneuvering area to be able to actually follow code for that. So in that being, two spaces really need to be eliminated by code. Uh, 350, 611, C3, A6. Uh, planning board may issue a special permit for alternative parking configurations when the proposed design maintains an equal level of safety. No more than four cars will be visible from a public way. Now, here's the thing is all 10 cars are parallel, right? It's all parallel parking. Makes sense, except the avenue you see all 10 cars. So that is one piece of code. But the big thing, honestly, is more of a practical question here of, you know, 10 cars parallel parked in the smallest allowable space that's available. Does that actually make practical sense? Uh, and it's difficult to do, really. <laughs> um, you know, uh, cars will really be outside those lines, you know, partially in the driveway, because not that many people can fit exactly in that stamp, right? Now, another thing here is realistically, since we've already talked about these standards, there's a parking for about eight to nine cars on side, you know? That means that street parking will be necessary. Here is the piece here is that, you know, assuming one car per house is not really correct. Most people have two cars if you're commuting around and throughout the valley. It's not fully accessible. It's not like we're going to be able to have one car per household exactly. It's going to overflow onto Glenwood and Day. Now, one of the big things here is that, you know, not only do they have multiple cars, they're also going to have guests. So, you know, if you have guests over, they're also going to increase traffic on those two streets. Now, the big thing here, and this is where I get a little emotional, is that, you know, I work from home at 35 Day Avenue. I personally see all the time people get sideswiped, hit along that street. This and coming out from Glenwood into Day, right there where everybody gets hit. I've seen one of my neighbors across the street get hit three times in the last three years. That's going to increase with this proposal the way it is. And again, I think it's a good thing for infill. My major concern here is the practicality of scale does not make sense. And it's going to increase the amount of people who get hit and hurt in the parking. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Byrne. I am at 21 Glenwood Avenue. I am the car with the cool Camaro. Um, my husband would be <laughs> thrilled that, that you mentioned it. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, curb cut and traffic. Um, and just to reiterate what my wonderful neighbors have been saying, again, we are not against infill. We know that we live in a city. We all chose to live in a city. However, putting seven units on this relatively small piece of land just feels like too much. Um, so we ask that you kind of think think about that a little bit. Um, so I am at the end of the dead end of Glenwood. And so the uh, option to kind of have the one-way driveway um, does not feel very feasible. Um, uh, like Aaron had mentioned earlier, I truly believe that this will be a cut through. Um, we get all sorts of people driving down our street um, at least 20 a day kind of start on Glenwood and then they realize that it is a dead end and they turn around because the signage is incredibly small. Um, and I just, it, it feels like it's going to be used not just for the residents, um, which of course will create issues with snow removal because as Aaron also mentioned, they do just plow to the end of the street. Um, and some winters it was to the point where we couldn't even open our front gate because it was such a large mountain. So um, th these are just things that eventually will end up costing the um, city a lot of money and probably a, a lot of heartache. Um, so just talk about a couple different um, uh, codes that we're a little worried about. So um, 350.88G, so uh, the planning board may only issue a second curb cut if the applicant can show that there's something unique about the property that would otherwise render flow to and from the property unsafe or unmanageable. 
which we do not believe that they have done. Um, and the planning board may, as part of the site plan approval, allow additional driveway curb cuts if and only if such permit would promote and improve safe and efficient traffic circulation. Um, so the current plan calls for two curb cuts. And we, as I said, we do believe that this will increase traffic um, in, in on both of our streets. Um, and so um, the uh, March 14th meeting, I guess this was also a part of the conversation and the board, hold on one second. Okay, um, so the board said that I do not, or I wouldn't want the roads to be connected to be cut through. This was referring to the Ryan Road project. And so, you know, to us, this feels very similar. It's it's creating a through way that will ultimately need to be maintained. And um, I don't think that currently it is. Um, so uh, the the curb cut was approved with a condition that the new curb cut not connect to the, to the existing curb. This is um, part of the March 14th meeting. Um, while we understand that this is not a major project hearing, we feel that the sense of the board was that cut throughs are not desirable. Um, okay, we are also concerned about the turning radius in the driveway, but that's already been discussed. Um, so traffic. So the only traffic analysis presented is a one sentence statement regarding peak hour traffic flows. We believe they need to provide a much more comprehensive analysis that includes areas covered in uh, 350.11.5b. So we feel that their analysis must account for additional traffic resulting from the cut through nature of the driveway or from guests entering and leaving the property. Day Avenue um, already has more than double the traffic count than nearby streets, and the development would only increase the numbers. Our figures are taken from the 2013 study available through the Pioneer Valley Planning. Um, the developer is also planning to contribute $7,000 to traffic mitigation. We think it should be $8,000 to take into account the additional traffic coming from the new units on um, in the existing building. And... Pretty much in conclusion, we have um, concerns about opens. We have concerns about um, traffic flow and um, and definitely that pathway. We would love it to be a pedestrian bike path. That would be a wonderful enhancement to the neighborhood. Uh, cars going through, we're concerned. Thank you. Are there other people involved in this presentation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Just a couple of final points. Um, uh, attachment 350, attachment 78C1. Um, all projects shall include a, a park or common area fully uh, designed and constructed to be integrated within the project, and it needs to be accessible and available to everybody. How is this being addressed? Uh, also adjacent to Day Ave, we will preserve the existing dwarfed cherry tree and uh, create a shared outdoor area parklet uh, around it with several benches. We contend that this meets only the letter of the law. Anyone who's lived on Day Avenue knows that nobody sits in their front lawn or their front porch. There is massive traffic, eight wheel, 18 wheeler trucks, um, loud motorcycles. If you look at any time, pretty much any time, people will be in their backyards or their side yards. They never sit in their front yards. <laughs> so basically this parklet is gonna be not functionally a uh, common space. Design features, um, I'm gonna walk over here for a second. I think this is correct. It may not be, but I believe it's correct that the tall wall is going to be completely blank. So people, um, who are going to be looking at that? I may have these oriented the wrong way, but regardless, there's gonna there's a tall 34 foot tall wall, 20 uh, 24 or 30 feet wide, that basically is blank. That if you're in your backyard or you're on Sherman or Glenwood, that's what you're going to look at. We would encourage uh, the de the developer to find some design features that could make this a little bit less um, unpleasant to look at. I would call it. Um, finally, uh, or another point is there's a material 
required by various sections of 350.11 that are missing from the proposal. We've listed them in the comments. I'm not going to go through them here, but we would like to see all of those materials provided so that we, the public can look at them before it's approved. In summary, as a group, we're not opposed to the development at 39 day. We know there's a housing shortage and that infill development is probably the best way to deal with that. However, we do oppose the development in its current configuration. We think that the lot could easily support two duplexes, let's say, no cut through, the driveway coming down day, I mean, off of day, with parking that's distributed more uh, effectively uh, uh, with the two, the two duplexes and behind the current right. building, giving a lot more open space and pleasant open space for people to be in. Uh, we feel that it would increase the amount of open space, fit better with the mass and scale of the neighborhood. It would move the parking away from public view and be more harmonious with structures and open space in the neighborhood. We strongly urge the board to continue the public hearing until the developer has responded to code violations, requests for missing information, and other concerns. We're concerned that approving with conditions would remove the remainder of the process from public view, and we really strongly object to that. Thank you very much for listening to our comments. Thank you. Uh, uh, Carolyn, there were a lot of questions raised there. I'm thinking it might be helpful to go through some of them before we continue on. Um, where do I want to start here? Do you want to make see if there are, are we done with in person and then do chat or? Do you want to do this first? I kind of want to do this okay. first. I think it'll okay. be easier to keep track of okay. these questions. Yep. And then no we may address questions that other people have. And okay. so um, yep. uh, so one of the questions, one of the concerns that was raised was related to stormwater, particularly given the experience uh, following the development on Sherman Avenue. Can you remind people who they should call if they feel the stormwater system is not working as it should? Um, Shh. Sure. Um, so they, um, if they're, particularly if there's frozen water in the street, that um, DPW should be notified. The issues on Sherman Avenue are um, not believed to be related to the five unit condominiums. There's the water in the street there is the water for that project is directed to the rear of the property and there's an infiltration basin. Um, Department of Public Works thinks that they, um, there may be some issues with the existing catch basins in the street. And of course, we've had monumental rain over the last year. Um, but so nevertheless, if there are issues, um, and questions about stormwater, they should go to Department of Public Works. There was also, I just note, an as-built plan submitted for the Sherman um, stormwater system, and it was certified to have been constructed the way it was designed. And so there doesn't seem to be any issues with the functioning of that system. Great. And so we already talked about the stormwater for this project and uh you described that the system's going to be different but over so uh different than current conditions but an improvement over current conditions um likely because the water will be directed away from where it might be infiltrating now to you know abutting parcels it's going to be collected and um retained on site and then discharged underground through the systems the piped system and just to be clear for our audience, um, the Department of Public Works does all the stormwater review, not the planning board. So we rely on them for stormwater right. calculations. This, right. As a city's engineer and the stormwater um, assess the stormwater management plans are and I'm sorry, stormwater report and analysis is rigorously reviewed by the engineers at DPW and they make sure that it meets the state stormwater standards and what the city's obligated to um, review and approve. Right. And they provide feedback to the board as the city's engineer. Yeah. Um, there are a variety of questions raised that I think it might just be helpful to clarify what policies are in place. So relative to the width of the sidewalks, I'm because this is a 
it's not a public sidewalk. So I'm guessing the normal standards for width don't apply. So there is a section in the site plan review that does say internal sidewalk. So private sidewalk should be a minimum of five feet wide in residential districts. And that is to address, to ensure there's accessibility. So if people are um, have mobility devices that they need to use, there's enough width to accommodate that. Um, so that could be looked at. And then that leads a little bit back to the open space. Sidewalks are specifically excluded from the open space calculations, not randomly, but because um, we don't want people to say, I can't put a sidewalk in because then I won't have enough open space because sidewalks are beneficial and provide, you know, um, a necessary component for, um, you know, walkability. So those are specifically excluded from um, you know, the impervious calculations. So they could widen the sidewalks without affecting their open space calculation. Um, there were also questions about the location of the transformer. I'm assuming if DPW had concerns about that, they would have raised them relative to... It's all national grid. Okay. Um, national grid gets to decide whatever it decides. And yes, it could have an impact on the site. And so if things need to move around, that might trigger a site plan amendment um, if it materially affects the site. But there's no telling what National Grid will do or require. Okay. And they won't, I mean, they could give guidance, but until you're ready to get a permit, they're not going to specifically, I don't think they'll come out and tell you where it's going to be until you're ready to go. Yeah. Um, the require the requirement for a single curb cut versus two curb cuts. Uh, you had actually written us an email about that. Can you just remind us what the standards are? Since this is greater than a two-family, they are allowed two curb cuts. So it's site plan is a one of the neighbors um, read the section of the code that is required. So you so the board has to determine that it's in that the second curb cut improves um, safety in the network essentially so um, many times that can mean distributing the traffic to different streets and that reduces the impact so if you had a loop driveway all on the same you know in the same block that's going to create this um you know in and out trips in the same location whereas if it's a you know, spread across in onto two different streets, then you're distributing that load. So um, that is very much in keeping with that standard um, as opposed to making it less safe. Um, well, and I just, uh, I want to, there was a comment about the snow. I mean, DPW can't block driveways. Well, they do that all the time in the snow. <laughs> but they wouldn't necessarily continue to push up in the same way. I mean, they'd probably have to maneuver and push the snow. So it's not just piling the entire street snow, just that end of the street <laughs> in front of driveways. Um, but, um, you know, that that's a that's a question that happens all over the city. It's not, a, that's a separate conversation. That's a maintenance management issue versus whether or not you should approve a second curb cut. And the traffic analysis question um, and the payment in lieu of um, yeah, that, can you talk a little bit about the requirements here and how they have or have not met them? Sure. Um, so for... The units that are triggering site plan, um, the applicants required to address their incremental increase in trips. And that's based on the code, an assumption of the peak hour trips from each unit. Um, so the code requires one, um, essentially identifies one peak trip per new residential unit. So that's, a, and the, that equates to $1,000 worth of work or payment in lieu of, um, that unit that is under construction now did not trigger site plan. So it's not part of this calculation. 
So it would just be for the seven new units. And then um, also note that that four of the units are considered half scale units. So in terms of that question about dedicated open space, that's a parklet, um, that's only triggered for full units. So it's really, it's really um, essentially two, those four half scale accounts as two units plus the three more, if I have the number right. So um, that's five. So it's not going to trigger the dedicated park space requirement. They still have to meet the open space, but it's a different review once you get into the higher number of units, um, seven full units or 14 half scale units is what the trigger is for that. Great. Thank you. I have some follow-up questions um, for the applicant, but I'm going to save those for the end and continue with public comment. Are there others here in council chambers who would like to speak about this project? Okay. Your mic, Stacey. Yes. Oh. The you... definition of a duplex. Oh, thank you. Do you happen to have that? Um. So it's an attached unit. So anything that can create an attached structure. Um, um, so if it's detached the, and it's considered a principal structure, if it's detached, meaning it's not connected in any way, um, it does have to be 10 feet apart. Um, and there's no definition saying what constitutes connection. Um, but if a roof line is connecting two structures, so you could have a breezeway to a garage and that garage is considered attached. So that would be, and, and so um, these are the units that are shown attached by a covered um, roof area would be considered attached and therefore, I guess, duplexes because there are two units attached. I think when the two family zoning was written we talked about this exact potential possibility as hypothetical so yeah i mean that you could build like a hundred foot long breezeway and they'd be attached you know, right sort of what we talked about yeah no <laughs> you would have put a stop to that conversation <laughs> um if there are Folks on Zoom who want to make public comment, please uh, submit your comments via chat. And a few. okay, we have a few already. Um, I can't see them. So Carolyn, can you read them? Yes. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so Gwen Nabod, um <laughs> Curious. I'm curious how long it will be before there will be a rental unit. I'm here in support for Day Avenue and would love to be sure it's a mixed income in some way, whether it means an affordable type of mortgage allowance or in some other way, a unit or two that are truly accessible for mixed income. Ultimately, I'm here to support increasing building, increased building of housing. Um, Je then there was a comment about please speak into the microphones from Jackie McCreener. Then another comment, Gwen Nabod, I'm in love with this project and I'm here to support it. It means there can be pollinator plots to keep. It means there can be pollinator plots to keep a part of a biological corridor or herb tea garden. Please approve and support. Having green spaces that fit in are things that make a house a home. What is the price range and affordability question mark? And out of curiosity, I wonder how much water those trees take up. Just a thought. Um, okay. Um, and she also added, I'm interested in the accessibility features. And then Jacqueline McCreener as a homeowner at 124 North Street. I support my concerned neighbors on Day, Glenwood, and Sherman. I like many things about Danny's proposal for development at 39 Day Avenue, but I live in the neighborhood and I know how high the water table is on my own yard and how stormwater easily overwhelms this neighborhood in general. It does seem like development of this parcel in terms of residential units and impervious surface areas could place further significant and potentially deal-breaking burdens on an already saturated neighborhood and overtax municipal stormwater management system. And that is the last 
chat comment. Okay. Um, further discussion among the board? You said you had some questions for the app. I do, yes. Um, just related to some of the questions that were raised in the public comment, um, if you could talk about the um, side setback of the sheds, the width of the sidewalks, um, the, I think it's the Western facade of the buildings. And if you want to plug in your presentation too, just so we can see the site plan again. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I'm loading it again. Uh, the sidewalk was a bit of an oversight. I think in the process of minimizing pavement, that ended up being a little narrow. That can go to five feet. Um, what was the second question? Sorry. There was a question about the uh, side setback of some of the accessory structures. I think the sheds. I think an accessory structure is like a built structure that's a certain square footage. Like just purchasing a little plastic thing from Home Depot. Does that does that qualify as an accessory structure, Carolyn? Even a chicken coop does. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I will move it. We will move it a few feet so that it honors the setback. It's, it's the one by the the existing house that's the issue. Is that the one that's the problem? I'm not sure it was specified, but that's the one that looks like it's on the wall. Okay. Yeah, we can adjust them or maybe switch to like does a storage box count as an accessory structure? If we buy a storage <laughs> box instead of a sh small shed, just curious because we could switch maybe to. If we have to put it in a location where I don't want something that tall because it will impact the site negatively, instead we could do sort of an outdoor storage box, but you can't get as many good things in it, but it's something. While Carolyn's looking at that, the other question was about the uh, facade, the Western yes, facade sorry. of the building. That's what I've been working on getting Got it. this whole time. That looks reversed from what the elevations show. Because it's all the roofs it's are. The, yeah. Okay. The south should be facing this. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> the, the facade that we're seeing there as blank, and that was the question all raised by the abutters. The sun, it, it's, they're solar oriented. That's not, I mean, it, that, that is correct. Yes, it is. It is a blank wall, but it's not. We've reduced the height. Um, Can you approach the podium, okay. please? Thank you. We've reduced the height um, what in conversation with the PV people. And so, yes, the height will be lower than, I don't, I don't recall what it is right now. It's not 30 feet. Um, but it, uh, yes, it will be a blank wall. There are, currently are no windows. The, that's the wall that will have the um, uh, staircase. Was, was so the just... original proposal like a 12-12 roof? And yeah. now you're going down to like a 8-12 or 7-12? 7 yeah. And just to clarify, the height definition is based um, for a pitched roof is taken from the midpoint of the gable. So even though the dimension at the very peak, I think, was um, 35 feet, the actual height is, and it was listed on the plans as, I think, 29 feet. But now it sounds like it's going to be lower because you take it um, at the midpoint. You take the measurement at the midpoint. But yeah, but the height of the wall is accurate. Yeah, well, it's... it's it's not what's on the model, though. Those are all 180 right, degrees. Split. Right. So that what's on the model is a little misleading. That, you're not seeing a blank wall from day up. You're seeing a double slider door with a patio. Yeah. No, no roof. If it's turned around, you'd see the roof in the day. Oh, I'll see the roof. Yeah. yeah. Well, there is also a house that's not in this model. So, but I can't fault you guys for the model that you didn't build. It's a beautiful <laughs> model, but thank you for the model. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so with the one-way driveway thing, did you look at doing it the other way? Like, why is it one way that way? I just think about all the, I trust all the residents of 
the street would never use it as a cut through, but I just imagine I can just the UPS and the Amazon drivers. I can speak to the reason it goes that way because uh, typically when you pull over to park, you're parking on the right hand side. And if we come in the other way, we talked about it, then that fence hasn't got a chance because <laughs> they're going to be parking to the left. Right. Or else they could park against the houses. It's just, it's an attractive nuisance to have a one way, a cul de sac with a one way exit from it because it's just so tempting that I don't see without a huge do not enter sign and being one way into. Glenwood that you'll ever keep people from going on that street. Even a do not enter sign. I don't know if signs uh, don't do anything. Do that, yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, I have a lot of concerns about that traffic pattern too. I mean, I live down the street from there and I know day is a pretty crazy street. Um so I can see I could see a lot of people using that as a cut through. But I don't know. I can't think of an, a way to I don't know. Is there a way to stop people from cutting through? I don't I don't really see it as a benefit as a cut through. I would if it was going the other direction, because a lot of times people are queued up on day trying to turn left mm -hmm. to go to the rotary. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you could just turn left and cut through there and get to the next one over, then you could skip that queuing. So I would right. be more worried if it was going the other direction. The direction it's going, if if you turn down and I don't know. I don't think there's ever a problem if you're traveling from Hadley. You know, there's a whole bunch of cut streets to go through. That's true, right? Right, like you're never... It's more people who just find themselves on Glenwood and want to get out without yeah. dealing with... Right. Good road. Good yeah. street. Good street. Yeah, no, I'm sure people get on... What is it, Glenwood? I mean, I've never been down that street because why would you go down it? Um, but if you go down it by mistake and you're stuck, I could see trying to cut through there. Or the deliveries. I mean, right. Deliveries. Or the deliveries for sure. Um, I don't what was the rationale if you're you have to park on the left when you come it's hard to parallel park. Parallel parking, you know? parking is yeah. easier to park on the right. I don't know about that. Right. But the spaces could I still be on the I think that's personal. It's just more it's just more what people are used to. If you're heading in that direction, typically you're parallel parking on the right hand side. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You yeah, don't, you don't parallel yeah, park yeah. over on the left hand side heading. Depends if you learned in New York or not. No, well, there straight. you go. Or one way in New York. So. Or in England. <laughs> but then the steering wheel is on the other side. <laughs> um, structures are all are defined also, or storage containers are defined as structures. So this would be an accessory structure. You can't even look at anything within four feet of your property line. I find it hard to evaluate whether or not this arrangement with the two curb cuts promotes safety, because if you eliminate the second curb cut, then the traffic configuration as it exists doesn't work. You'd have to basically redo the site plan in order to have parking on. I mean, you'd have to do something different in order for traffic to flow within the site if you only had a single curb cut. So I, I'm struggling to... Uh, evaluate it based on that criteria of safety. Well, it is it is possible. I mean, you could just have a driveway that goes along one side of the property, and then you have little pull off parking spaces. Yeah, but it would have to be along that driveway, like seventy five percent wider. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot more paving, right? Does that promote a safe traffic pattern or not? Right? The amount of paving isn't what's in the standard. No, but well. I mean, I think the issue relative to that is if you have two curb cuts coming in the same portion of a par parcel. And you've got two-way traffic in both of them. That is more dangerous for that block face to have two curb openings 
on that parcel. And some way, so some ways you've granted them, you have a, just a one way in and a one way out. So you're not, you're not dealing with sort of four traffic patterns, you know, two, um, two, two directional, but one, you know, two curb cuts with one direction only. And this is comparable to that, but it's spread even further away. So you're taking off some of that, you're taking the trips, some trips off of each of those um of that street i i think there's a an issue with the one way the direction it is i think exiting on today from here on into a turn seems harder when you exit onto glenwood or it's straight on i think there's ways to you can never eliminate the, the cut through nature of it 100 percent, but there's ways with changing of pavement or, you know, have a sign that says severe tire damage or something. <laughs> I don't know. There's, there's, there's things you can do to really limit that. I don't think, I think people can park on either side of the street parallel parking to the degree that they can parallel park at all. But most of the cars now have a button on the thing that makes the car parallel park itself. So. I don't think that's a valid concern. If anything, you're closer to the, you see the fence, you just can't get out of the car, I guess, if you park too close to it. You can get out of the car either. <laughs> I mean, I have that concern for the passenger, like a passenger can't right. get out of any of those parallel park cars. Yeah. I would look at maybe like pulling the curb, separating the curb from the fence a little bit. Yeah, more. have like a two foot buffer or something. Like that somehow, yeah. But this site's so narrow, it's like, if you do anything, you constrain Right. Constrain it. I mean, I I generally applaud like the creativity, and we've had a lot of conversations here about can we force people to make smaller units because that's what makes things actually affordable. And we had people leave the planning board because we didn't add that into our zoning really. And I think you know since this is something kind of like a Laurel Park or something, you're like, why don't they build things like that anymore? And we're trying to build something like that here. So I think I I do applaud the creativity, and I think it's a tricky. Um, geometric puzzle um i'm i'm i feel like it's a little too i don't think it's a density issue like the number of units on the lot particularly i think there's just like a geometry that's a little too tight at the knuckle at the turn um and i and i i worry that there's a lot being placed on like being able to get around an existing maple tree which it looks like it's a city tree I'm not sure. No, oh, yeah. That 17, it's a right, it's a city tree. Um so. so you're talking about the Glenwood only or throughout. I mean, the other issue is space could he be gained, but I don't know if it's in the right direction by um putting the duplexes together. You get gain more space. Um, I think there's a lot curve. of things that could happen. I mean, there's a lot of moving pieces here. They've spent a lot of time on this site, and they would know better than yep. we would about what to push and pull. Um, so those are the two things I'd like to see is flipping the one way with some creative solution at the Glenwood side um, to really dissuade people from going in that way. And uh, so do we just not have the site plan anymore? What's, what's going oh, on? It's on my screen. <laughs> can you put this? Can you put the slideshow? Not on the Zoom. So does that sound? Do it sounds like you might want them to come back. We have it on the screen, but it's not up. We have it on our screen. I don't know how to share though. You don't have to share. I, I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that city tree is a definite issue. I don't I don't think I know the right answer about the direction of the one way. I also don't think I understand. I mean, I guess you're having you're cutting in half the number of trips on either road, right? Just half of them are going to be ins and the other half are going to be outs, but it's half as many. So is that safer or less safe than not having two curb cuts at all, just having one curb cut where everyone goes in and out the same curb cut. Like, I mean, you're really um, paving half the site if you do that. It's not a viable project. 
I'm having a little struggle with the screen share here. Um, oh, there you go. From Zoom. Sorry, there Carolyn. Go. There you go. You should be able to do it now. Slideshow. I see the slideshow. I'm not... Only Carolyn can share a screen. I know. <laughs> it's just she like the Zoom problem. meeting. I mean, the reality is these neighborhoods that we like so much were built before we were building everything with cars. So I really would not want to see them share screen. put a huge loop of pavement on this site. That's definitely no better for, I mean, I don't know what's viable. It's also definitely not better for the stormwater. Well, there, would, there wouldn't be more open space than is allowed. So there would be less units is what it would end up being. Right. It would just look like a CVS. You know, a few, it would be like a building in the middle of paving. I mean, basically, that's how it would have to look, which is what most, you know, sprawly places look like. That's, you know. All right. Thank you. Thanks. So there's, there's really two. Well, that other tree might not be a city tree. It's that one that's right, it, right there at the, the O in Glenwood. Right. Which other tree are you talking about? Oh, sorry. I thought there was another tree above the O in Glenwood. I thought that's the tree we were talking about. That is the tree we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, what about the one above the L in that's, Glenwood? That they're adding that tree, or that's on their property. Okay. System. Yeah, and... In terms of the city, in terms of the city tree, I mean that's going to be a DPW process. Um, my guess is that, um, and, and they'll have the tree warden will have um, regulatory oversight over that and how that you know if. And I didn't get comments from the tree warden on this one, but um, you know either way, that's a separate process. So even if it was on the plan and the tree warden came back and said you can't take the tree down and this is going to kill the tree um they would have to adjust the plans to that because that's a completely separate um regulatory review yeah i mean so my comment you know i don't like where this driveway hits glenwood um i think it's in the shoulder of the road and where cars park currently so for me it seems like it should be coming off more like where the parking spot is shown um more in the middle of the road for this direction and then if they reverse the one-way direction like david's talking about it would need to be even further to the left to kind of come out in the right lane of travel right which i think could be accomplished if those um half size duplexes but become actual duplexes and push together um you know and then they probably just look like the duplex on the end just smaller so that to me would be a way to kind of push everything to the left of the page and get a little bit more room for the drive aisle maybe has the added benefit of taking the drive aisle from being like six inches from that unit which again just seems like dangerous i mean it seems fine for a driveway but this kind of elevates to more than a driveway because you have 10 people plus parking on it um so it's kind of like a you know mega driveway so it and just i you know this parallel parking is so tight with a six foot fence right again i mean it's like it's the letter of the regulations but i just don't think it's like feasible so. but again i don't have to park here so so it sounds like that you're you all might be leaning towards wanting to see if there's a way to adjust the plan if that's the case maybe you can do a straw poll or to see to identify the issues you have concerns with and let the applicant figure out how to address those concerns and then come back as opposed to trying to figure out what the solution is one comment I, yeah please step up to the mic um 
the reason that we thought the one way was suitable in this direction is because of the lower speed limits and the lower traffic on Day Avenue. We didn't think it was appropriate to bring people out to route, additional people to Route 9, one block from the light. We thought that would make a much more congestion and danger. Can you, can you explain that again? I'm, I'm not getting that. Bringing people, if everyone exited this site to Route 9, it would be adding traffic to the very busy road that's higher speed and it's one block away from the light so it it would exacerbate the backing up at lights that happens throughout northampton um and then the other thing that i did want to mention was the the reason for the location of the parking space at glenwood and i we absolutely understand but it really is the tree we would have to find out if the tree were not in play then that probably would be a suitable thing to flip that design. The only thing we, that would concern us then would be our turning radius. It might have to become then one of these back up to turns. So again, we uh, that that's why you're seeing what you're seeing. What what is that internal radius there? Like two foot? No, I think it's ten. Isn't it? Where's that? The internal radius. Is that five or ten? I think it's fifteen. Fifteen. Or just the curb the curb radius right in front of that unit. Yeah, if I can zoom in here, maybe we can see it. Can I zoom this? I think, I think it's so. Fifteen feet. It's fifteen. Uh, can you see it? Yeah, it's. I think. I think it's fifteen, because I think it's a thirty foot diameter. It's about as small as you can go and still get around it with a car. I mean, I think we are so conditioned to trying to like look for drive aisles that you can like zip around, and I think this is like much more of like the shared street, like Dutch Wunder flight kind of style, of, like use the parking to slow the traffic down and make it less of a attractive nuisance for cars to zip in and try to get through. It looks like someone's driveway. Like that is not a place that an Amazon driver is going to necessarily want to go. It looks like someone's property, you know? So I think it's going to be thing, slow. I think. I think it's going to be slow through there. I think, you know, and I looked around the whole neighborhood and, you know, it, they are very narrow drive aisles in our dense neighborhoods. And this would be that. It would be that by definition. And there would be people parking in there, and you'd have to be slowing down to maneuver around people. Mm -hmm. I don't see people really wanting to use it as a cut through, especially since you can go right up and take a right hand turn on a day. Um, so I. Right. With it in this direction as proposed. With it, with it in the direction that it's it's currently proposed. Right. I, I don't really like the idea of flipping the direction of it. I don't know that having a having a loop is the way to go, but can I speak to something? That's a different question. The uh, one of these plans does have on it a note to put the "Do Not Enter" signs that day on either side of the entryway, so to help try to prevent people from going down there. I think people will pay attention to that, like driving the wrong way on a one ways. I, I think if you don't know, you'll think it's a driveway, right? I don't. Yeah, I don't the sign you know, it's gonna. Oh. Right, it's a house with a driveway. It's gonna look like a driveway. Yeah, it's gonna be pretty narrow. <laughs> the open space issue, it just is so tight. And uh, it's tight the way it's arranged for all the issues that we've been talking about. But I'm also just not convinced that mm -hmm. when this actually gets built, that they're going to have actually met the open space requirements um, when there are some really easy ways, like actually pushing the duplex, the, the half size units together that would go a long way to making sure that that would actually be met um, without you know, reducing the number of units that are going on to the property. Um, so I might be interested in seeing a version of the plan that showed that um, just to ensure that we really do maximize the open space a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I think all the values that this project is going for are right on. And I think more than anything, I think I'd like to see the personally, and I'm, I'm not speaking for anyone else, I'd like to see it with one less structure. And I think it'll be much easier to do all of the things that this project's trying to do and not be right to the just barely legal like limits of everything. And, you know, the patios can be the size that they want them to be. And 
all the all these things are not going to be right to the nth degree. I mean, I have no idea how the pro forma looks when you do all that, but you know, that's yeah, you know, that's for someone else to decide. So nine units and eleven parking spaces, mm -hmm. as proposed. And the applicant said they slightly exceeded the requirements. What are the requirements there? Are ten? Just one it's per. Ten. Isn't it just one per? Yeah, so but nine? I, th I think one of the units in the front, the larger unit in the front, um, calls for two. Oh. So I think it's three and seven. Okay. So it is ten. Yeah, that might allow, I mean, if you had one less unit, you could have one less parking spot, which might make right. the parallel stuff easier to make work. I don't know. What's that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> do what? Oh, parallel park. It, technically, they could already yeah, get rid of a parking space without getting rid of a unit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So either get rid of one of the parallel spots to just make that a little bit more flexible, or get rid of the one by the bollards to deal with snow removal and other issues in that corner. I think if the one. Uh, you know, there's still an issue about that um, public shade tree. Mm -hmm. So that's that parking space is um, pushed down next to the tree. So that might be the one that yeah. gets removed. Mm -hmm. yeah. You said the 12 drive aisles with the fire department likes? I think that gives them enough width. I mean, they prefer 15. Right. To get the okay. Biggest. Yeah, and does the tree warden usually have ideas about, I mean, once you cut in a pavement cross-section that close to a tree trunk, like, is that even feasible? So it sounds like we probably need to talk to him or the applicant needs to talk to him about, yeah, you know. Yeah, and it would be separate. Like, they could go to the... Um, Carol, in your mic. Sorry. They could go to the um, tree warden and the tree warden says, no, you can't take the tree down. I mean, typically we, or sometimes people have done that before they've come here. Yeah. Right. Just, yeah. Just time that it hasn't. Right. So then in theory, if we were to approve the project, but then the tree warden said, no, you can't mess with this tree, then they would need to come back anyway with revised plans that show how they're not going right. to impact that tree. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to condition it. Right. I mean, I, I, I would go for a continuation so yeah definitely but what are we gonna yeah what are tell we gonna them <laughs> i said what i like <laughs> <laughs> i also do want to recognize i saw some people um here raising their hands again is there more public comment that people want to make tonight it, i do think we're going to end up probably continuing but um yeah if i can just speak really briefly to the the thing about the cut through and why people would use it when the light clogs up on Route 9 and people are, want to get somewhere, it happens. She has a ring camera, and actually when she says 20 cars a day, she, she has the evidence. 20 cars a day, drive down Glenwood Avenue, get all the way to the end, turn around on her Camaro in my driveway, and then accelerate back up Glenwood Avenue because now they're mad because they thought they were going to get out of traffic but instead they now have to get back onto Route 9. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it won't happen in the first month, but eventually, if they can get through at the end of Glenwood Avenue, they will figure that out and they will do it. And then it will become de facto a public street rather than a private driveway. Um, I, I just, I, I live there, I've lived there for 25 years and I've watched this happen. Um, so that's that's why I think it really is um, n not just craziness, but actually people do actually already come down Glenwood Avenue. Um, do you, do you, what's your opinion if the flow is reversed? So if you could come off of day, there's a bunch of people trying to turn left off of Dave onto Route 9, and you know that you can turn left and cut through here and get over to Glenwood. What do you think would happen then? 
I think I mean I I can't speak to that. I I hadn't I haven't thought about it as a as a possibility. Um, I think it's less tempting to turn off of Day Avenue because it's clearly a, a through street and you're almost at the end of it. Whereas when you get to the end of Glenwood Avenue, you either have to do this eight point turn or, huh, does that go through? Yeah, I'm I'm just that also really looks like some single family home with a driveway on yeah day. right no i agree it's not going to be a fast cut through for sure given the width and the turning this reminds me of those little yeah. and the fence repair crew off this little street off market there's those little brick apartment buildings and they have like a loop driveway behind mm -hmm. and it's hard to turn around in those streets and i've tried in those parking lots and i've always regretted it, it. <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to speak? Yes. So if you were lost on Glenwood, instead of knowing all the neighbors and turning around and going back out today, and you went through our driveway, you would actually reduce the nuisance to the Glenwood people. <laughs> and I think the question then becomes, is it going to become a habit? Are you going to do it all the time? Because ooh, you found a little cut through and you can tell your friends it's pretty tight in there. As somebody noticed, noted, like there's going to be people walking. It's like a Wooner style. There's going to be people parking, parallel parking, you know, like you're not going to be able to just race through there. So it's not going to be like, woohoo, I just found a cut through. That's going to be so much better than just waiting till I get to day Avenue in 20 feet. You know, like it's, it's, it's going to actually probably reduce their nuisance, not the other way around. Cause people aren't, they're going to find their way through our private drive. It's not going to be, it's a non-issue. It's not going to become a huge issue. I really don't think it is. That's my personal opinion. A couple of quick points. Uh, one is I believe that the sidewalks on the four smaller units are directly, the three foot wide sidewalks are directly next to the driveway. If they make those five feet wide, it's going to encroach on the driveway by two feet, which I think is problematic. They would have to move the units back, which would make the drive, the, um, the back patios over the uh, setback line. I think your idea that we need to reduce the number of units is really the way to go because trying to, you know, make small workarounds for all of these different things will just result in not meeting that that forty percent. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out was the reason that we brought up Sherman Avenue flooding is that when the water from this uh, project goes into the drain on Day Avenue, the next stop is Sherman Avenue, and it's going to increase the flooding on Sherman Avenue which we think is a definite negative. Thank you. Thank you. Well, reducing the units doesn't change the issue with the five foot sidewalk. I don't understand the five, we don't, these aren't sidewalks, right? It's internal walkways. They don't need to be five feet, do they? In the code, yeah. For all yeah, I mean, walkways. I think they would just change, they wouldn't connect the two fronts. It would just be out to the driveway. Huh. Okay. So I, um, it sounds like, um, a continuation to get information about um, maybe potentially putting the units together, is that what you said? And for open space um, to show five foot sidewalks, get an assessment from the tree warden about that tree. Um, well, and also, I mean, something else. The after effects of that are like the outlet of the driveway, but also there's just like a transformer there. There's just like a lot of things that have to go right for this plan to work and... yeah and the accessories meeting the side setbacks as well because like if the sidewalks have to get wider and the buildings need to get pushed further then the patios need to get smaller i mean there's yes there's okay even little shifts i think are going to make a big difference on this particular plan right but I, I would be very interested in what the tree warden says for kind of an offset from the trunk you know because if you're cutting in a pavement cross section within the drip line of the tree, you're going to damage the roots. So I just don't even know if that tree has to stay, if there's room to get anything past it. Yeah. They're, they're drawn very small on this plan. <laughs> I do want to recognize this um, member of the public. I just want to make a quick comment about the direction of the driveway. One concern I have, especially as the next door neighbor, 
is that if the addresses are all still labeled as 39 Day Avenue, that means the exit will be where the addresses are marked. So I'm concerned about delivery drivers, DoorDashers, Amazon coming to 39 Day Avenue, being at the exit and either going in the wrong way or turning around in driveways, neighboring streets and other sorts of nuisances like that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to make a comment about the content full comments we're getting from the public tonight. So thank you for your organization and lack of repeating things over and over. Yeah. Well done. And thanks for making uh, zoning based arguments yeah. too. I appreciate it. Very much. Because that's the only thing we have purview over. Talked about a variety of things that we would like to see in some revised plans. Are there other things that people want to see when the applicant comes back? Talked about the sidewalks, setbacks, open space, possibly moving the buildings together, information from the tree warden about that maple, the transformer. I wish there was the width to do like what you're doing on this short leg to do that on the long leg, like make it like three parking spaces and then, you know, weave a little more. That would be great. I don't think you have the width to do it, unfortunately. Nice chicane. Is that what that's called? Did we ever talk about lighting? I thought you were talking about no, streets. There's and no stuff. sight. I thought you would have all the all the lingo. Lighting. I don't. There was. not French. There's one light over the basement, the the shared storage. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then lights yeah, on the lights. sound lights yeah. on the units. That's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Switch switchables. Okay. Anything else, or is there a motion? And also, Carolyn, timing. Oh, yeah. Right. So you have a joint public hearing on April 11th with Legislative Matters, and also uh, another uh, a site plan amendment um, also scheduled for that from for the Y um, for lighting. Are those assigned times right now? Are there times? Yeah, seven o'clock for sure, joint public hearing because Legislative Matters is coming here. Um, and then I think the 11th, I think the Y is at eight. Um, so you could do it after, you know, at 830. Or you could push it to April 25th. And I think we had a four at least for the 25th. You're out. I'm out the 11th. Oh, you're out the 11th. Um, Chris, you're out the 25th, right? Or no, you said you were around, but you depend. Isn't today the 25th? What's today? Today's the 27th. I think I'm around today. Okay. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go to the email and, and see what this you said. And there's someone, if George... Thought you were talking about today, not April. If someone like George is available for that later one, he can watch the video. And he would yeah. have to watch the video. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um. So let's see. But Sam can't do it either way. So. Right. But if one of us is not available, then we don't have a quorum. Right. Well, but... But we only need four, right? Because it's right. site plan. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was the other one we need the five? Curb cut. No, that's a site plan. My so, bad. I got mixed up with the two family. So we do okay, need five. so um, need Dana's, five. you're here the 25th. Stacy's a maybe. Okay. David, you said it works. George can be here. You're here. So that's four. Okay. So the 25th would work. Do we have anything else on the 25th? No. Okay. I hesitate to add this after two other yeah. substantive hearings. Okay. It also would probably, yeah, give some time for revising plans because two weeks is a quick turnaround. Time. Yeah. Well, and for the tree warden. And right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you could, there's nothing on the 25th, so you could continue it to the 20th, April 25th at 7 p.m. 
I move we continue to April 25th at 7 p.m. Second. Okay. All those in favor of the continuation? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I don't think I have any A&Rs. Let me just double check. <laughs> Just, um, just for the public's consideration, ANR stands for approval not required, and we are required by the state of Massachusetts to to not to approve it because it's already approved. We just endorse it. Endorse the fact that our approval is not required. Yes. Well. Just, endorsement yes. is required. Yes. Yes. Okay, You're just, hang on, just confirming a that a new subdivision is not being created by the division of the lots. Yes. Oh, geez. Okay. Oh. And also, just so the public knows, the city council adopts zoning ordinances. Okay, I don't Not have any A and Rs, and I didn't. Thank you. This to you. Thank you for that public service announcement, Chris. No, I really don't. Yes, I do both. So, are you looking at a motion to adjourn? I think Carolyn's checking. Yes. Um, no A and Rs. No A and Rs. No minutes. We already right. talked about the schedule. Um, no, I do have other updates scheduled. So, so 11, so April 11th, yes, we talked about that. Um, also we are tentatively, I sent this out, tentatively looking at May 9th as a public hearing for adoption of the historic preservation plan element into the sustainable Northampton plan. So May 9th um public hearing to uh, um adopt the historical preservation plan element into the sustainable northampton plan it's tentative um we have to that would be during our regularly scheduled yeah meeting seven, it would be seven o'clock the first item up and that's just no no legislative matters or anything for that right it's just planning board yes is there going to be a presentation about what's in it or just? Yeah, so uh, um, yes, either we or combination with a consultant. Thank you all. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Very interesting. So okay. that's the only other thing that heads mm -hmm. up. I would like to enter into the public record that uh, Carolyn Mish got a five star review from Jackie Balance for her rendition of public comment. Good job, Carolyn. <laughs> Wow. Congrats. Northampton's got talent. <laughs> okay, so I think that's it. The agenda. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? No move. I second. All those in favor? So adjourned. Uh